Okay, so I'd like to uh, welcome everyone for coming to the uh, open day on uncertainty in artificial intelligence theory in large-scale applications. We had a great example over the last week of planning under uncertainty because we didn't really know what was going to happen with the snow. And so we ran our models on it and we decided we we're going to defer deciding until uh, the lunch. We're certainly going to go as planned until lunch since the lunch is already ordered. And we'll have the poster sessions. And about the afternoon sessions, we'll decide uh, as late as possible since our algorithm determined this is the optimal strategy. You guys are already here, so what's the point in deciding? Um, I'd like to start really by thanking our sponsors who made this, uh, uh, this day possible. Uh, we have funding for the National, from the Israeli Science Foundation as part of our uh, Center of Excellence in Graphical Models. Uh, this is a center of excellence that includes five researchers at the Hebrew University, uh, the three afternoon speakers, Neil Friedman, Tali Tishbi, and myself, and Amir Globerzen and Galilee Dan, who are in, in Google at the time, right now, but are part of the center. Uh, I'd also like to thank our, the Ministry of Science and Technology, who fund this open day as part of the uh, Center also for Excellence, or Center for Knowledge in Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning. Uh, and the Intel Collaborative Research Institute on Com Computational Intelligence, which are also very generously uh, funding this day. And I, since uh, I'm giving the, I'm here in two different hats, uh, I'm a member of these centers and I'm supposed to speak in the afternoon. Uh, but another, uh, pers uh, another uh, sponsor of this day is the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and I'm also the head of the School of Computer Science and Engineering. So I'll t I want to just use this opportunity to say a few words about the uh, school. Uh, so uh, we are all a third. Uh, another sponsor of this day is the uh, Rachel and Celine Benin School of Computer Science and Engineering. And so I just wanted to take the opportunity, since we have some people here who are not from the school, just to tell you about what the school is, where it's going, uh, and what you should tell your friends about the school. Uh, so we have 47 and 3 quarters faculty members. Uh, it's only at the Hebrew University that you can have fractional. That are uh, uh, situated across three buildings, the beautiful Rothberg buildings that you're inside. Uh, which have the computer science and computer engineering faculty, which are about 39 faculty members. We have another uh, eight or nine faculty members who do applied physics, who sit in the Bergman building. And we have two half appointments in the bioengineering program, which sit in the Silverman building. We have over 1,400 students, of which uh, 1,100 are undergrads, uh, 200 our master's students and about 100 do a PhD. I'll talk more about how they, uh, what the programs are that we offer. I think one take home message that I hope you all take home is that we have incredible growth both in our students and our faculty members. Uh, so this graph over here is just the number of students in our school as a function of time, as a function of year. So we had about 1,000 in 2000, we're at about 1,500 now and we're planning all our Models predict that we will continue to grow uh, at approximately this rate in the next two or three years. So I wouldn't be surprised if you make 1,700 undergrad students in two years. This is the number of faculty members we, uh, in, this, in the school that goes from 35 to around 50. And again, all our models indicate that we'll continue to grow. We have support from the university to grow by something like an, an additional 20 faculty members in the next five years. So if you either have friends who want to study here or have friends who want to apply for a job here, yes, this is the time. We have the positions and we're growing. Just a few words about our educational vision, what makes us different from the other computer science and engineering programs around Israel and maybe around the world. So I think one major thing is unlike all other uh, universities in Israel, we're interested in bridging the, the gap between science and engineering. If you go to Technion, if you go to Tel Aviv, obviously if you go to Weizmann, <laughs> you won't see uh, computer science and computer enge and electrical engineering in the same uh, building. Specifically in Weizmann, you won't even find them on campus. 
And so a major vision that we have is that we have the computer science and the electrical engineers as part of the same group. And in our teaching, this is because we, we offer a three-year program in computer science, which currently has 770 students. But we also have a four-year program in electrical and computer engineering, which currently has 200 students, and another four-year program in electrical and computer engineering with a specialization in opto and microelectronics, which currently has 100 students. So again, if you have fam family members who are thinking of where to study, a lot of people don't know that there's an option to study electrical engineering here, but there is. We have excellent students and excellent faculty members. Uh, the other part of our vision, which is very unique, is that we want to combine computer science with other disciplines. We have a fantastic program that hope you'll hear an example of maybe in the afternoon from Nia Friedman's research that combines computer science and life sciences. Uh, we have a very unique program that combines computer science together with the B'Tselel Academy of Art. So students there study a full undergraduate program uh, in the arts as well as in computer science. And we're just opening a new one on computer sci society and networks, which will combine studies in computer science and the social sciences. Yes, we have the brain, that's true. Uh, our research vision, again, I think is unique and it's connected to this idea of our undergraduate program, is that we really think that computers are not just, computer science and computation are not just for computers, uh, but we'd like to solve technological problems using computation. So computation is no longer confined to de desktop or mainframe computers, but computation is everywhere, whether it's cars that drive themselves, or it's uh, medicine, personalized medicine. Computation, I think, is at the forefront of solving technology, technology in the 21st century. And that means that if we think of the theory that we need to develop here in the university, it's far and above the standard computer science theory. Although Google might not like to think of it, its self-driving car has to obey the laws of physics. And so uh, we are, our students, we want them to study physics, to study biology, to get to be exposed to much more than just mathematics and computer science. And also a lot of things that are not part of the traditional computer science um, curriculum and our and research, we want them to be in this building, whether it's signal processing, control theory, information theory, game theory, statistics, and of course, data science. So I think this, uh, now I'll take off my hat as a head of the school and go back to the, I, don't th I think this, the open day today is really a prime example of the kind of research uh, that we think should, is, is part of the, of the vision of our school, uncertainty and artificial intelligence. Uh, really, if we want to solve technological problems using computation, we'll, we need strong theory and we need to reckon with uncertainty. And I think the talks, the exciting lineup of talks that we have for the rest of the day will help us see what is the um, forefront of research these days worldwide in this area. So with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Are we already at 10 o'clock? So I'm, we can start. Yeah. Yes, okay. So our first speaker is uh, Professor Max Welling from the University of Amsterdam. I think Max embodies a lot of what I talked about because he was trained as a physicist, uh, did his first postdoc at Caltech in artificial intelligence and computer vision, and did a second postdoc with a name that will crop up a lot uh, during today's lectures with Jeff Hinton. Uh, so he did a postdoc with Jeff Hinton, then he moved to UC Irvine, where he was an associate professor before moving to the University of Amsterdam just last year. Is that right? And his talk is entitled The Return of the Helmholtz Machine. So please join me in welcoming Max Welling. All right, now that I'm all wired up, um, let me start by uh, thanking the organizers, uh, Yair and Natali and Nir for this, inviting me to this wonderful workshop and also Ronit for extremely good uh, organization. Um, so I'm gonna talk today about uh, Helmholtz machines, actually, um, and there's, there's two topics as you will see in a minute. Um, this is joint work with my amazing two students, uh, Dirk Kingma and uh, Taco Cohen, and as usual, most of the work that you will see you know, is being executed by, by these two students. And lots of the credit goes to them. Um, so here's the sort of the plan of today. There's two 
seemingly different topics that I'm going to talk about, but they're uh, connected. Um, and the first one is basically the, re the return of the Helmholtz machines, or the revenge of the Helmholtz machines. And um, the second topic is basically the elementary particles or parts of data. Uh, this is around group theory. And then if time allows, um, I can still talk a little bit about uh, machine learning in the browser, which is a sort of a slightly lighter topic at the end. Okay, so um, in the literature of machine learning, um, when we, in the times we were doing graphical models mostly, um, <clears throat> there were three types of models that we were typically studying, and they all had their arrows pointing in different directions. Um, so there are sort of Bayesian network models, which, or otherwise called sort of, uh, uh, no, let's say Bayesian network models, um, and in the deep learning literature, they were called the deep belief networks, where you have some latent factors at the top, where you're sort of independently generating from, and then it sort of goes through a number of sort of stochastic transformations until you sort of generate your data here at the bottom. So it's called a generative model because you can actually generate data from that model. Um, you can sort of remove the, uh, the, the arrows, in which case it becomes like a, a, a mark of random field, um, or in the deep literature, it's called these days a deep Boltzmann machine, where you have multiple layers basically of associations between these layers. Again, this is a generative model because you can generate data from it. In this case, it's a whole lot more complicated because you have to run a Gibbs sampler over this entire sort of structure in order to generate your data sort of at the bottom here. And then there's another class of models um, which I will call discriminative models um, where you're basically interested in a mapping from, from some input, let's say an image, uh, to an output, which is a target label. You want to figure out whether there is a face in an image or whether there's a car in an image. Um, and this sort of, the arrows point the other direction. You give the, you know, the, the input data and you transform it multiple times and then at the end is your target. Um, and sort of this in the deep, liter deep uh, learning literature is, is typically something like a deep neural net or a convolutional network. And of course you can put some probability distribution at the end, but it's a conditional model of sort of target given input. And um, it's kind of interesting to think about, you know, what are the advantages or disadva and disadvantages of generative versus discriminative models. So as generative models, the reason I like generative models so much is that you can actually model something, right? It's, uh, you know, you can imagine the generative process of how data is generated. For instance, you could have a very sophisticated model of a vocal tract in order to try to understand how speech is synthesized. Um, and so you can actually inject your expert knowledge into your model, which is a very powerful thing to do. And then you can simulate data uh, from your model to sort of look at you know, how good your model is or what your, what your model is thinking. And you have probabilities all over the place, right? You have them in, on every variable, target or input. You have probabilities, and sometimes probabilities are really useful for planning or reinforcement learning. As disadvantages, I see that if you want to do classification and you have this conditional model that for every label you have a model to generate um, sort of data, um, then in order to do your classification, you have to invert that model using Bayes' rule. So you have a model for x given y, and you need to come up with a model for y given x, and you have to invert that. And Bayes' rule is often expensive, um, and as we, you know, and I will generate, and I will argue that actually um, it might also be inaccurate. <coughs> um, and in particular, this happens if you have a lot of data. If you have a lot of data, then imposing sort of your biases on the problem, um, you know, might not be a good idea if you're just interested in classification. And the reason is that the world is always more complex than you can imagine. It's very, you know, it's not very often that you have exactly the right models. If you have a lot of data, there's details um, that you will not capture by your generative, you know, imagination. 
Um, and so it might, when n is large, actually you might impose too much of your expert bias, and which means that your classifier is limited. So for discriminative models, you know these are these can be very flexible mappings from in, you know from input to target. You know the latest model may you know boost 10 billion parameters like these deep neural networks, enormously no, an enormous capacity. Um, and since uh, and they can be trained very efficiently these days by running basically stochastic gradient descent on GPUs. Um, and so if you're just interested in classification. Um, and you don't care much about some of these things up here, then these models are working better right now than the generative models in, in the large data limit. Um, as disadvantages, uh, you know, I, I, I see it's just hard to inject expert knowledge in these models, and, al and also they are very hard to interpret. It's just a black box, you stick something in, something happens and something comes out. And since you're not sort of modeling the generative process, you cannot go back in and say, okay, what happened to this particular variable that I actually have an interpretation for? And so, um, <clears throat> but there may be a way, and there was a way um, in 95, where <coughs> there were basically, both of these models were present in one single um, model or one single sort of learning machine. And it was called the, uh, the Helmholtz machine by, by these authors. And the idea is really that um, you know you have a generative model on one side, you know generating latent variables and then going to X. Um, but then in these models, it's typically very hard to compute. You, you need for the learning update, you need the posterior probability of Z given X, sort of something like this. You need to figure out what the distribution over the latent variables is given your input, and that's a very complicated. Um, typically a very complicated procedure. And you have to run uh, sort of MCMC, which is very slow and very, no and very noisy, the high variance, or you have to run variational algorithms, which have a strong bias typically. And so it was very hard to learn these models. Um, and what people, did, you know, what these authors did is they sort of came up with a sort of a model that worked, you know, went the other way around, which started at, at the data X, and it was trained sort of separately to predict or approximate that posterior distribution over the latent variables given the inputs. And so these two then sort of uh, danced together in order to do the learn, sort of to come up with a learning update. So we had uh, basically some model for Q, QZ given X and, and we could sample from that model and using those samples we can then train, you know, compute a gradient for the log probability. And then in this is called the wake phase. And in the sleep phase, we would sort of dream from the model, generate lots of samples, and then train up the recognition model. But the problem is that there's actually two objectives that are sort of trained separately, and there's not a single objective that's going up. And in fact, you know, this, this model had problems. You know, the, uh, the algorithm had problems to train. Um, okay, so I'm still very interested in Helmholtz machines. Um, and the, the reason is you can sort of view it, you know, look at them from two directions. The one direction you can look at them is say, well, from a generative view, right, um, the recognition model is helping us approximate the posterior, and so we can learn more efficiently. And from a discriminative view, you could be interested actually in this mapping. If Z is a target, a label, then this could be your classifier, and you can use your generative model so to, to uh, regularize that disc 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 discriminator. Um, and uh, of course it's then very important that P of X given Z is very flexible. And there's two interesting data sort of uh, limits. One is what I call the big data limit where you have lots and lots of data relative to the number of input dimensions that you have, which is what the Googles and the Yahoos typically use these models for. Um, and um, in that case you can make um, you know, P, P of Z given X has many, many parameters, and you know, you will have to make this generative model really, really complex in order not to limit the model. Um, and uh, you need to be able to train these models very efficiently. And we will see that both of these things can be done with the Helmholtz machine that I will propose. And there's the opposite case, which I think is very interested for the life sciences which is when D is much larger, larger than N. Um, if you think about, you know, like an MRI scan, it has a couple of million voxels, um, or, you know, fairly soon we will have 
uh, sort of our, all our uh, genomes sequenced. Um, you can carry it around on a credit card, so that's billions perhaps even of inputs. And the number of patients hopefully isn't growing all that fast, right? I mean, it's, it's the number of dimensions per patient that's growing fast. And so, in this case, it's actually very interesting to, um, to use P of X given Z as a, as a regularized, as an as a informed regularizer for the classification model. Um, so typically now people use dropout, but dropout is a really blunt knife. It's just saying, well, let's scale half of the model half of the time, um, and then sort of, sort of hope that sort of it doesn't overfit. But if you can have a way to regularize these models by injecting your prior knowledge, your expert knowledge, that seems to be a much more powerful way to regularize. Um, and the other thing I will show you is actually that the model we propose very nicely supports unlabeled data. So in other words, a form of semi-supervised learning that, is, that could be very useful here because we could pool all information from all patients together under one big pool and then train a specified classifier for a particular task. Okay, so um, the Helmholtz machine that we propose is uh, sort of a new version of, you know, a, a new a variation of the old theme. And uh, we will use the variational Bayesian framework in this case, but we'll use it in a slightly twisted way. Um, and um, so the variational Bayesian framework basically says uh, you minimize the KL divergence between your model, so this is your generative model, uh, jointly over X and Z, X is observed, Z is latent. And with this part, which is, this is the data distribution, the empirical distribution, and then a variational model that maps from X to the latent variables. Um, and in order to learn, you know, both Q and P here, um, we can, the P step is sort of standard, you know, EM type algorithm um, update, where you just sample your Zs, and then you just do your P update. But the Q actually, you can just look at this and just take the gradient and see what happens, right? And uh, you know, you can do that and then you get this expression. Um, and you just wonder why people never used that expression before and I have an, uh, sort of an explanation for that. Uh, but first of all, of course, you cannot compute it. When this Q is sort of a computed <laughs> expression itself, you know, this is not an expectation that you compute. A typical variational base assumes a Q distribution that's highly tractable, so you can do integrals you know, analytically. But we will step away from that. Um, so this is uh, what we need to approximate. So the first thing is that um, we actually, there's a sum over data points in here hidden somewhere. And um, if you want to have a scalable algorithm, um, you do not want every update to depend on every data point. So you know, think of a limit where there's an infinite number of data you do not want to have an algorithm that depends on an infinite number of data for an update. So you, have, you, you need to be able to subsample your data in order to become scalable. And um, there is a, sort of this nice work by um, these authors where they applied uh, sort of mini-batch sampling or mini-batch updates to variational, uh, to variational algorithms. And we sort of be building on this. It's called stochastic variational Bayes. It's not very difficult. You just subs subsample you know, some of the data and stick it in here and it becomes a stochastic update. And the other thing is where we deviate from ordinary vari variational Bayes is that instead of having a tractable distribution Q, uh, Z here, we will actually come up with a distribution that it, the only requirement is that it's very efficient to sample from. So in other words, um, this could be a neural network type of discriminative network that starts from the input, one pass <coughs> up through the network, and then generate Z's independently and efficiently, right? And um, so now we have two sources of, of variation, you know, if we stick those samples in here, one is from, you know, subsampling the data and one is from sampling from Z. And now this update, update gets very, very noisy. And I'm sure people have tried to run this update um, and for that reason, it just doesn't work because your gradient is just uh, uh, completely uh, noised up and you know you cannot learn anything. So actually sort of recently people have started to sort of realize this, um, various groups, and sort of the, uh, the, the, you know, the approach that we took in order to solve this is, is very, very trivial, but uh, you know, but it, but it solves it. Um, so basically you move from the typical Bayesian network view of things, which is you know a, a probability distribution of Z given its parents, um, you move to a slightly different one, which is to say, 
Well, let me just um, sample epsilon from some standard distribution. Let's say a normal distribution with zero mean and, and, and unit variance. And then think of the transition here as a deterministic function of its parents and this epsilon that I've been generating. So this is just a function, and that's actually a stochastic process. In statistics, they call this the centered form and the non-centered form. And the, ma the main point is that this distribution doesn't depend on the parameters anymore, and you can just take gradients very easily. And so then the gradient of the, um, uh, of the log likelihood it looks like this, and it, you know, where, z, where z is being sampled from, from abs, you know, uh, z is a function of epsilon being sampled from p of epsilon, and then it, it's like this. And it actually solves this variance problem. The variance is much lower for this particular estimator, and other people have come up with other ways to reduce the variance. But once people started to understand that the variance was the problem, people could come up with, with new solutions for it. And now the whole sort of framework works, it's very nice. So now we can actually build you know, very complicated uh, generative models, which are basically Bayesian networks, uh, but in this sort of new uh, non-centered view, where you, know, you, you generate something stochastically at the top, then you go through a number of uh, deterministic transitions, like a neural network, and at the end, sort of, you generate uh, you know, x given z. And then there's this <coughs> recognition network that goes up. You start with an input data point, and you go through a number of neural network transitions, and you predict a mean and a variance, and then you generate z from that normal distribution with that mean and that variance. Right? And then you can stick these two into your objective, compute gradients, and just maximize a single objective function. OK, so if you do that and you train it on faces, so here's sort of what you get. Um, what we do here is we sample through z phase. So this is like a plane that's flying through z space, which is the latent factors. And at every z, it generates a face, because that's the generative model, and we can do that. And uh, what you see is as you fly through z space, you know, you change from, uh, you know, from uh, between races, you change between genders, from uh, sort of orientation, uh, from smiling to uh, sort of uh, sad. Um, and, the, and the nice, so it basically means that the z variable, these latent variables really capture the sort of independent um, directions of variation or independent factors of variation that we think are important in the universe. And as I said, um, this could be very nicely generalized to semi-supervised learning. And especially in the life sciences, I think this is very nice because we could use our generative models very much here um, because we have, we have good generative models, but also we have little data compared to input dimensions. Um, and in, in addition, we can actually add you know, lots and lots of you know, unlabeled data to the, to the pool. And in that case, the generative model is as before. You know, we have sort of semi super sometimes observed labels y, never observed latent factor z. They're independently generated to produce x. And then from x, you know, we, we have two channels, one going up to predict the label y. And uh, you now this is actually, this could be your classifier here, y given x, because this is a target. And then from y, you then inject sort of information from both x and y into this channel, which is again a neural network -y type of you know, architecture, to produce your distribution z given x, y, and this one, you know, they go back into here and then you sort of run your, your, your learning algorithm. So there's one little sort of hack that you have to do to make this work, I'll admit, which is that um, you're really interested in this channel in the end. So if you're interested in the classifier and you sort of use this sort of more as a, as, a, as a regularizer for sort of this sort of classifier, then you want to update the importance of that a little bit in your gradients. And so we sort of hack in um, sort of a, a, a variable which says, you know, when you do your updates, give more importance to actually training that. And that improves performance um, a little bit. And then you can sort of play around. So actually, Dirk implemented sort of a very nice environment where you can sort of, you know, stick in some, disc, you know, some, uh, some stochastic nodes, you can stick in some deterministic nodes, right? And you can sort of almost graphically build your model. Um, 
And uh, sort of here's another version where you sort of go up, you generate something stochastically here. So these are deterministic transitions. Then there's a stochastic node here, and then you go through your sort of two-channel thing. And the uh, same thing here. And actually, that improves, it turns out. So here's some results. Um, I don't want to overclaim, um, but it, for the model that we compare to, it worked very well. Um, you know, we compare it on MNIST, of course. We always have to comp compare on MNIST. And then there's a bunch of other data sets that we compare it to SVHN and NORB. Um, and the, mo the method particularly shines in a semi-supervised limit. So this is our method here. These are these other ones. So, uh, this is a transductive support vector machine. This is an ordinary neural net and a convolutional <coughs> neural, neural net. Um, they're not necessarily semi-supervised. Uh, manifold tangent uh, embedding model, um, contractive autoencoder, and this is our model. So, th so this model is quite similar to our method in, in, in certain ways. And you see that especially in the limit when the number of labels is small, um, this method shines because it can use this generative model as a, as a regularizer. And um, so here what I show is basically, uh, again, flying through Z space. And for every value of the latent factor, I'll just plot. Uh, but by the way, these movies were made by Dirk uh, King, not by me, of course. And I'll plot for every label Y, I'll plot the digit uh, Y. So the class label Y is being plotted here. Um, and then Z is this, this the writing style. Right? And so you see, for every class label, it will sort of follow a particular writing style. And sometimes it gets thick, it gets slanted. So again, the factors Z sort of change sort of within the class. And the factors, um, and Y is, of course, just the class itself. And then you can do the same. You know, this is another data set which is a bit harder. These are sort of, uh, uh, no, uh, sort of uh, photos of, of, of digits. And again, sort of it, 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 it is able to generate from Z sort of the, the style and, um, and Y is the digit. Z, right? So it's, it's the latent factors. So so there's the latent factors at the top that are, that are sort of, uh, that you're flying through that Z space, right? And for every value of Z, you then generate an image for every value of Y. So Y is the, is the, so the class label, and Z is, is the latent factor. So how do you explain the distribution of the So uh, it's being learned, um, but also in this case, um, I think he, you know, it's like a smooth sort of trajectory in that space. OK, so that's sort of uh, for the first half um, of the talk. Um, but, it's very, but it's very interesting to see that these hidden variables z, um, they uh, represent the independent factors of variation. Of course, this is a very old story going back you know, to a distributed representations and so, and so on. But z are sort of the, uh, or even like factor analysis, right? So they, they represent the independent factors of variation in this model where y represents sort of the object class. And so y changes the class, and z changes within a class. Right? So if you keep y fixed, your object class, and you change y, it's like the way you write the digit. And, um, but it doesn't change the actual digit. <coughs> um, and so we can think of z as a symmetry transformation, as a transformation that will keep the class invariant um, but will change the, you know, the way it's sort of perceived or written. And symmetry transformations, um, I think, are very interesting. Um, they underlie a lot of you know, the great theories of physics that we have. Um, you know, in clearly in the standard model, the elementary particles are all organized by these symmetry groups. They're all representations of these symmetry groups. Um, and even in sort of uh, general relativity or uh, sort of special relativity, uh, observations are related through Lorentz transformations. It's basically, you know, how fast do you fly, th you know, pass by something uh, if you observe something. So it's the same thing you observe, or the same physics you describe, but just observed in a different way. And in physics, they basically require that the physics doesn't change under these symmetry transformations. 
Um, and in general relativity, it's even stronger. It's basically saying that the physics should be invariant under general coordinate transformations, uh, basically connecting acceleration with gravity. It's very, you know, and it's, very, it's a very strong um, sort of principle to follow. And so the, the question that we ask ourselves, well, we actually have symmetries here too, right? We have symmetries of, of objects that we can transform and maybe this group theory is a good way to study that as well. Um, and in our case, the, the question basically comes down to, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm looking at things around me um, which are highly entangled. So if I have an image, if I look at the particular, uh, you know, the, the, the values, the color values on each pixels, you know, it's a very strange representation because if I rotate something, then all of these pixel values were, will change uh, in very intricate and complicated and uh, dependent ways. Yet we don't have any problem with this, right? Because if I turn my head, I still interpret the world in exactly the same way. And so we may have sort of some of these invariances built in. And so where the input distribution is by like a big spaghetti of things that is all, all sort of run together and knotted up, you know, what we really want is sort of we want this clean image where everything gets disentangled. Uh, we find these independent factors of variation, uh, but actually I will argue in the next slide that um, we can go a little bit further is that symmetries might also mean that um, symmetry transformations act linearly on this space and that non-symmetries are orthogonal to this. Okay, so this is um, sort of repeating what I just said a little bit. Um, so we really like a picture that is sort of like this, where we have objects in the world, um, and every object is represented by sort of a plane. And um, when, we when we transform an object into itself through a symmetry transformation, we really like that to be a linear transformation, something very simple. Um, and when we move from an o one object to another, you know, this could be a much more complicated transformation that's orthogonal to that plane. And the reason why we really like this is because if we run our classifiers to, to, to sort of classify or discriminate between object A and B, we just have to put sort of this linear classifier and it would work really well, right? So some com something complicated will become linear in this space. It's very similar to kernel methods which try to, uh, to do this too, but in a different way. Um, and so uh, the path that we were on is we say, okay, so we want, we really want sort of to split the, the information into these two streams, which is also well known in computer vision. We want uh, invariant and equivariant transformation. That is transformation that doesn't change the object in symmetries, that sort of change the, one, the object into itself. And both are interesting. One is interesting for object recognition and the other one is more interested in interesting for sort of motion understanding. And we sort of say, well, there is a very unique mathematical theory to study this is called group theory and we'll do that. And the other thing which group theory doesn't sort of supply is sort of a probability theory. So we've learned a hard lesson in AI and this is also the topic of this sort of uh, workshop. The hard lesson is that we should really not forget about uncertainty because our algorithms will become very non-robust. Um, and so what we really need is to combine group theory with probability theory and this is exactly sort of what I will do in this talk. Uh, so this is work with uh, Taco, um, and Taco again was uh, sort of um, done most of the work for this. So um, again, I'm going back sort of what does it mean uh, to be entangled? So I have an, an image of a four, and I rotate it over, over 90 degrees, and I look at this image, and for us, you know, I can still recognize this as a four, um, but for, in terms of the pixel values, it's completely changed, right? I mean, some black ones became white, and other one, uh, white ones became black, and it's very unclear how to sort of do this um, if you don't understand uh, sort of uh, how to transform it into pixel space. And so the pixels are not the independent, are not sort of the disentangled representation because every pic when you transform every pixel value is a complicated function of every other one. But it turns out there is a representation um, where this sort of the, the, the elements in that representation rotate into each other and have nothing to do with the elements of the other part of the space. And that's called an irreducible representation. So if you look at a rotation or any transformation by a single sort of a conjugation with some matrix W and the matrix for two dimensional rotations 
you know, look very nice. They look sort of these, like these circular Fourier sort of patches. And then on the diagonal, we have um, some matrices, and I'll say something about it. Um, and uh, yeah, let me just do that now. So in a little bit more detail, so there's now sort of coming a few more equations for those. Uh, I hope you can follow this, but you can ask questions. Um, so if this is my matrix of transformations, um, then the irreducible representations sort of look like this. They're sort of subspaces. So uh, there's all zeros out here, and then there's just numbers here. There's blocks of transformations that take a subspace. Like so this could be a one-dimensional <laughs> subspace, and this could be a three-dimensional subspace, and a five-dimensional subspace. And instead of, you know, when I <coughs> apply this matrix, clearly it only maps elements of that space into itself. Um, and any sort of transformation that's compact um, can be represented by, let's say, angles, um, and its, it's differentiable to sort of a lead group, um, can actually be brought onto this uh, sort of generalized, diagonalized form. And if you identify these, what's called irreducible transformations, so it's irreducible because they cannot be made any smaller. This is the smallest subset of things that can turn into each other. Um, then if I say representation, it really means this. So if I take my matrix element for the elf block, and M and N are the, are the elements of my matrix running here and here, um, for let's say one rotation over an angle G, and then I multiply in matrix notation, I multiply you know, the same you know, T for that level L block, um, but for another rotation over an angle H, and what I should get out is the, represent the, 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 the matrix T, but then for the sum of those two angles. So that's basically, they represent a group. And then the other thing is that very nice is that this T's actually are orth orthonormal. So this looks quite demanding if you look at it, but it's not too bad if you are sort of familiar with ordi ordinary Fourier analysis, right? If in Fourier analysis, one of these blocks is just one number. It's a complex number, e to the ILG. It's just a phase. Um, and we all know that you know, um, with these, you can do Fourier transformations. I'll show in a minute. And they are orthogonal. So basically, if you, in this case, just integrate over an angle G, and um, you, you stick in these, these elements here, they are orthogonal. So any two um, will only give you some value if the, um, you know, the L are the same. <coughs> so in other words, they are an orthogonal, orthonormal set of basis functions. And for SO3, it's more complicated. It's called it's, they are the Wigner-D matrices. But, and um, I'll just not go into details here. Um, and now the next step is to do a harmonic analysis on these groups, which is basically saying um, we are now interested in functions on the group, uh, sort of square integral functions. Um, but we're interested in functions on the group. And any function on the group can basically be expanded in this way. So it's a, th these are just numbers, but they, they are indexed in some uh, sort of with three numbers, these, these three numbers, M, N, and L. And these are our irreducible representations. And then I sum over all of these values here. And it can, any function that lives on that group can be expanded in this particular way. And then I can define its inverse as well, which is, you know, if, if you give me the function and I, and I sort of integrate over the group, or you know, in this case, for instance, the angles of the group, then um, I can get my eta back. So this is just very similar to um, the things that you would do for an orthonormal basis um, in, in linear algebra. And we, and, and we look at this and we can sort of recognize that this actually like a Fourier transform of a function f because if you do this for SO2, you know, you know that every function f on a, for an angle phi can be expanded in, with these phase factors. And then we can get our phase, the, the, the coefficients back by basically, you know, uh, doing the, uh, sort of the inverse Fourier transform. So what's right? the connection between the complexity of the function and the dimension of the complexity? Sorry, Lee? Essentially, not every function can expand any dimension. Just like the bending of the yeah, yeah, that's right. So it's important that, um, uh, so these could be uh, infinite sequences, 
Um, but they have to be square integral, which sort of forms a, a Hilbert space. It's very similar to quantum mechanics, by the way, you know about that. Um, but um, when you get to fast Fourier transforms, right, you want to discretize, and then you want to have band-limited functions, and then you want to sort of be, uh, have, you know, make sure that you have eno enough points on the group so that you can do ex ex the exact Fourier transform. Right? Yep. Um, okay, so, uh, so here's the step that we made in order to make these groups then um, turn, turn these groups into probability distributions. So here's where the uncertainty comes into play. And we, oops, and we basically said, uh, okay, so a pro we need a probability on a group. And how do we do that? Um, we basically say that the log probability is expanded in these irreducible representations of the group. And if you stare at this a little bit, you immediately recognize the exponential family because T here are just the sufficient statistics and then eta are the parameters that multiply the sufficient statistics and you sort of put all of this in the exponent and then you normalize. So it's really just an exponential family where we sort of handpicked our statistics t very carefully here. And therefore, it's also quite easy to compute a gradient of this because uh, at least formally, you can just say, well, I'm interested in learning these eta parameters if I have like lots of data, let's say lots of example transformations, g. Then I can compute the gradient of this by just the difference between the moments, the moments over the data where you sort of take the expectation of your statistic over the data and you need to compute your moments over the probability model P itself. And then you compare them and then you make them closer to each other by your gradient update. But the main point here is that these, this one is typically you know, the, the showstopper. It's very hard to compute it. But for this particular model, it's, it's not so hard to compute it exactly because the existence of the fast Fourier transform. Because you can express this as basically a sequence of two sort of Fourier transforms. First of all, you take the inverse Fourier transform of eta. So this here is actually the inverse Fourier transform of eta. And then you take the exponent and then you take the Fourier transform back and then you have to normalize and then you get that expected value. But using fast Fourier transforms, this can actually be done very efficiently. And I think that's the core why this is interesting for computer science. Um, so then for, uh, for the group SO2, if you do this, if you just study what kind of distribution will come out, if you look at this, um, so in other words, if you just take this expression and you apply it to SO2, well, what will happen is you'll, see, you'll come with what's called the generalized von Mises distribution on the circle. Um, and it's basically, the, you know, if you have just one of these J's, you have the von Mises distribution, but you sort of have a, a number of domini a, 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 a number that you can pick yourself for different frequencies. And then you can play the following game. You can say, well, let's have observations which are sort of in, in some space, you know, say an image space, x, and then I rotate x to another image like this. So I have observed x and y. And now I want to infer the probability over the angles, the transformations, that are responsible for mapping this image to this image. Right? And I have a prior, this is, the, this is my prior over, over group transformations, and this is my likelihood, which is given a transformation, you know, uh, how do I get from X to Y, it's a normal distribution, there's some variance, and it turns out that these two are always conjugate. So this is actually a conjugate prior for this likelihood, and I can analytically compute the posterior distribution over the phi given X and Y, and it turns out, of course, it's an, again a generalized von Mises distribution, but uh, you know, with parameters k and mu changed. And so you can write it up, and so it's interesting. So here, from here to here, you have sort of four explanations in the, in the posterior, you know, in going from here to here, because there's four possible rotations which can actually explain this. And it's fuzzy because, uh, because our sort of likelihood model has some noise in it. If you go from a circle to a circle, clearly, you know, any transformation could have sort of done that, and so you have a uniform distribution over rotations. And if you take something more interesting, you get some sort of more a peak at the most likely explanation and sort of smaller peaks at rotations that are um, sort of less likely to have generated that. And then you can do this for SO3, and now it gets much more complicated because these are three-dimensional, um, you know, rotations. Um, so you can sort of, okay, so let's take a function on a sphere and sort of uh, map it onto itself, what are 
all, you know, all the possible transformations which could have generated this. Um, and then you get, you know, in alpha, you know, these three angle space, which are sort of identified on each one of the, on each one of the sides, you get this really intricate, complicated distribution over, over these angles. And for this transformation, which is not identity, but a small change, you get this one. So the point is not to impress you with these images, but it's like you can, you can actually compute this, which is t quite amazing. You can actually compute the complete posterior distribution over all the possible transformations which could have generated you know, a rotation from here to here. And this, of course, thanks to this fast Fourier transform. Um, and then we need one little uh, sort of additional thing here, which is that, um, you know, coming up with trans, you know, distributions over rotations is one thing, but maybe what we really like is to come up with distributions over spaces that we're more familiar with. Not, not SO3, but let's say I want to have a distribution over the sphere. Let's say I'm a geoscientist and I want to figure out what's the distribution over earthquakes, right? Earthquakes happen on the earth um, and I want to come up with a distribution over earthquakes. And the thing to do is that actually we have developed this harmonic analysis for uh, groups, so we need to sort of identify what is the, what is the group which is <coughs> equivalent to the sphere. And it's not very hard to see what it is. Um, you know, you can sort of say, well, like, let's take the North Pole and map from the North Pole to any other point on the sphere. And you can do this clearly by rotation, but there's many rotations which will actually do that. So in order to get from here to here, you can do, there's many solutions in SO3 which will get you there. And in order to identify the sphere with a group, you really have to have a unique transformation. And uh, what you have to do is you have to sort of mod out these transformations which turn the North Pole into itself. So you just you know, say, I, I'm not interested in these rotations, but up to these rotations, then it's unique. There's a unique transformation from here to here. And it basically, technically, it means you have to sort of do this modding operation. Um, the the take-home message is that, yes, we have identified a group. Um, and uh, we, so we can still do our Fourier and harmonic analysis using fast Fourier transforms on the sphere. So then if you do that, and so here is our sort of distribution over earthquakes. I think it's about 40,000 earthquakes or something like this. Um, and uh, so this is our in log PDF space. It's very important. So you see these small little dots here, but they're really tiny ripples because it's in log space. Um, and uh, so this is a harmonic exponential family distribution. And, um, so you see it, it follows you know, the actual distribution very closely. This is the most complex model that we could find for, distribution, for modeling distributions on a sphere. So it's called the Kent mixture model. Um, and uh, it's very hard to train, um, but we tried really hard. Um, and many restarts, et cetera, it's using an EM algorithm. And this is then the distribution sort of that we could come up with. It, you know, it's just a decent job, but it's clear that you know, it's much more fuzzy and not as sharp as sort of this model that we have, you know, the exponential family model. You do see a little bit of ringing here. It's very interesting because you're trying to compose this basically by adding these spherical harmonics together. Um, and you, see, you, you do see a little bit of ringing, but again, this is in log space. So it's, it's the, the ti these tiny little things are highly ex exaggerated. Um, and it looks like it's overfitting on these one earthquakes or these, these few earthquakes here. Uh, but again, these are tiny little um, numbers because it's in log space. So more sort of quantitatively, you know, you can, you can compare this um, uh, Kent mixture model with a, a harmonic density model. Um, here we have the log likelihood of train data for this one and test data for this one. Um, and here's for the Kent mixture model. So clearly, um, you know, our, on, on test we are orders of magnitude, you know, in likelihood higher than the Kent mixture model. And also if you think about you know, the, um, the time it takes uh, for, to train our model, so thanks to our fast Fourier transform, we can train very quickly because we are done training. We fit 22,000 parameters, of course, you know, regularizing appropriately um, around this time. And this is one iteration basically of the mixture model um, or sort of, sorry, it, 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 it's sort of equivalent to training a model with, you know, a few parameters for the Kent mixture model. Um, so it's more, it's more, comp you know, computationally demanding to train it, and it will not get you the same uh, test likelihood. And this is the best, you know, model around. 
in, uh, on for modeling densities on spheres. Um, <coughs> so I'm sort of toward the end of, of sort of the talk. Where I could, you know, I'll, I'll wrap up here, and then uh, if time allows, I have a little bit of extra things I could add in um, after, maybe um, a little lighter if time allows. Um, so the so the outlook is that you know I've been looking at these variational um, autoencoders as a way to combine discriminative and generative models together, and so that we can still save you know what we like most about modeling is injecting uh, our prior knowledge, our expert knowledge, and also we can exploit unlabeled data in the case we have many more uh, features than we have data points. Um, <coughs> And we can generate probabilities uh, to represent uncertainty uh, on all of the you know, labels and input spaces, and that's often important for sort of decision making. Um, and we have algorithms that can train these models very efficiently. And then related sort of to the space of representations that you will train that come out of these models, uh, we were thinking about, okay, what does it mean to disentangle a representation? And we decided that group theory and irreducible representations form a very nice uh, sort of mathematical framework to study those. Um, we have defined flexible densities on manifolds and transformations using these harmonic densities. Um, for this, the reason why this is successful is that there exists this harmonic analysis tool um, that is very efficient based on these fast Fourier transforms. Um, and then uh, the outlook is that we actually use these fast Fourier transform also to uh, learn neural networks, but that not only sort of do convolutions, but also uh, sort of like, like translations, but also do all sorts of other uh, symmetry transformations on the data. So um, I'm not sure, I should, should I stop here? Well, we take questions and if you have more time for yeah. questions. I think that's a very good idea. Yeah. Okay, so I'll stop here now for questions. Yeah. So, but real data, if you look at things like real vision or speech or whatever, doesn't have like, such nice symmetry proofs. And I wonder if there's any, any notion of approximate symmetry proofs. So the idea, the ideal case would be that you could learn the symmetry group. Um, although we haven't, we've tried it, but we haven't gotten that far with it. So uh, you can think of sort of a hidden representation like again, more like the generative model with Z going to X. You can think of a hidden representation um, and then you can sort of apply symmetries you know, to, these, uh, to these inputs, like the rotation over certain angles. And you could even you know, try to parameterize this more generally um, and then try to learn sort of the irreducible representations. It's quite hard to do it, um, but this is sort of our goal. We've We've tried a little bit, and we've uh, submitted that to iClear, but it's uh, it's it's hard. Um, but yeah, so so that's for top down. Um, for bottom up, it's maybe easier. So for these neural networks that we were talking about yesterday, actually you mentioned it yourself. This, I think this is an interesting match. Um, so uh, in this case, you could just look at you know the symmetries, you know maybe affine symmetries that are relevant for images. Um, and uh, sort of filter the input through this much larger group of symmetries, not just translations, but all sorts of other symmetries, and then have these pooling operations which try to sort of impose invariance, local invariance on, on all of these symmetries. So it's very much in line with what you said yesterday. Um, and uh, again, that idea may not be revolutionary, but the really important thing is that these fast Fourier transforms can be defined. And so that will make this tick because you know you can now actually do these convolutions with fast Fourier transforms and then you can actually make it work. Mm -hmm. And essentially you have an autoencoder, uh, 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 autoenco
Yeah, that's right. Sorry, information. I should have said that. Information bottleneck. Yeah. <laughs> so the information bottleneck is here, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you have one German system that goes from X to Z, and another German system that goes from X to X. Yeah. So with that, but but in that case, you will not have these stochastic units. Then is the idea. Right. The, um, that's what I'm trying to say. What is the difference or the advantage? Of right. So it's a bit it's a bit similar so to saying. The strange thing is that within the um, construction, right? Yeah. You don't have to go the same neural nets in two parts. You just yeah. change it in the background. What are the key differences? Well, and and. Um, so one of the things is you don't get probabilities and you're not representing uncertainty that way. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is exactly the same discussion that you would have by saying, okay, why do I even train a probabilistic model in the first place? Why do I need probability distribution if I just, you know, require just compression, right? And yeah. then I can, I can clearly imagine you will not need these probabilities. I'm just interested in these hidden units. And I don't think this will then add very much. But here you can actually generate from your model very easily. Like you actually, if you just disconnect this bit, you actually have a generative model. Where for an autoencoder, it's much harder, right? I mean, it's like you have to you have to have your input in order to generate your output, um, and you don't have a distribution on your on your hidden units. So if you talk to Jan LeCun, probably he will say you don't need that, right? You know, <laughs> it's all fine doing everything deterministically, and for certain applications, it is. But for others, I would argue it isn't, and this is exactly like when do you need uncertainty? And I think you need uncertainty, for instance, when you're doing planning or reinforcement learning is the case where you would need it. But they're very related. I mean, I could turn these perhaps into, yeah, deep nodes and come up with an ordinary autoencoder. Okay, well that's interesting. Um, you, you, you're thinking about some limit, um, some limit case where it will turn in that into it. Um, yeah, I I would think so, but I would ha I, I can't claim it now because I don't see exactly because you need a KL between things. If you turn things into delta peaks, a KL is not as useful anymore. So you maybe have to switch to another objective rather than the KL. Um, so yeah, have to think about it a bit more. Okay. No, I, th I think it's probably better okay. here to, to stop here. Okay. Uh, so our second speaker is uh, Danny Tarlow from uh, Microsoft Research. Uh, Danny got his PhD with uh, Rich Zemel at the University of Toronto, uh, where he also interacted with the same Jeff Hinton. And he was a postdoc and now a researcher at Microsoft Research in Cambridge. And he's going to tell us about A star sampling. And I would add that this work received one of the best paper awards at this year's NIPS conference. So please join me in, thank in welcoming Danny Tarlow. All right, great. Thank you. Um, so one other connection to Jeff Hinton here, since this is the theme, is uh, the student here. Okay. Um, the student collaborating with us here, uh, Chris Madison, is one of Jeff's students in Toronto. Uh, and then I'll say this is also work with Tom Minka, who's a fellow researcher at uh, Microsoft. Okay, so to motivate this work, I want to start off just looking at the broader picture a little bit. You've probably, most of you hopefully have heard of this term probabilistic programming. And this basic idea is at least the sort of motivation behind where we're going to go here. So the idea of probabilistic programming, if you haven't seen it before, <coughs> is what we'd like to do. This is, uh, sorry. There we go. Um, what we'd like to be able to do is we'd like to have the programming languages that we all know and use and love. Um, but we'd like to augment them with a few additional things. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to augment them with the ability to add uncertainty. Um, so how does this actually work? What happens is instead of assigning values to all of your variables, what you do is you add into your programming language uh, random number generators uh, from particular distributions. So what, what the example here is, I should probably start by saying this, this is meant to be partially a joke, but it came up uh, when I was getting my hair cut and the barber was telling me that a bunch of lawyers would come into the barber shop and then they would have to leave 
at 5.30, or they would finish up at 5.30, but they would all say that they were going back to work because they needed to be the last one in the office. And it was very important in the office politics that they left after their boss left. Um, so thinking about that, let's try to build a simple program that helps, helps these lawyers out. Okay, so the way that it'll work is what we're going to basically do is we're gonna build the simple model of when the boss is going to leave. And we're gonna have this programming language which has these random number generators in it, which basically allow us to say, I don't know what the value is going to be, but I have some uncertainty. I have some prior distribution over what I think it's going to be. So how would this look? Well, what we're going to model here is we're going to have a distribution over when the boss gets into work and how many hours in a day that the boss works. And then we're gonna have some parameters here. Don't worry about what they are, A, B, and C, and D. These will control some gamma distribution, say. And then we're going to say that uh, the gamma distributions have some shape that is given by these parameters. And then what's gonna happen is that each day, we're going to say that the arrival hour of the boss is drawn as a sample from this arrival distribution. The number of hours that they're going to work is going to be a sample from this hours worked distribution. Uh, and then the hour at which the boss departs is some deterministic function here. It's just the arrival hour plus how long they worked. Okay, so this is a very simple model. And then what we're going to do next is we're going to say instantiate this model and then we have this, these extra constructs in the programming language which are observations. And we're gonna be able to say that, well, we know that on January 27th, we saw that the boss arrived, say, at nine. Uh, we saw it on the same day the boss left it, uh, whatever that time would be. And then maybe the next day we don't know when the boss arrived, but we're able to observe what time he left. Uh, and then maybe we're on January 27th, we know the boss arrived at 10, and then what we wanna know is we wanna know what's the best time to leave at the end of this day, okay? Um, so how is this going to work? Well, we've constructed a model up here. We've added these observation statements with, which are conditioning on um, things that we've observed in the world. And then the third part is this infer statement. And so what this is going to do is we're gonna be able to give it some, um, some expression here and what it's going to do is give us a probability back. So in this case, we're saying infer what is the probability that the departure hour at a particular day is less than some hour that we give. So you know, at this time, what's the probability uh, that my boss is still here? Or sorry, that my boss has already left. Uh, and then you can imagine adding some decision theory on top of this and you can call this function in different ways and you can construct a function which says, for any particular day, what is the optimal time for me to leave? Okay? I'm sure this is not important, but this is my time to leave or the boss's time to leave? Uh, this is my time to leave. This is when should I leave? <laughs> um, right, so you can imagine you know, having this spin when you see your boss arrive or leave, you punch something into your spreadsheet or whatever it is. And then you run this program each day and it tells you what time to leave. Okay. So the idea of probabilistic programming is the user is the programmer just specifies this. And then from that specification, like we saw in the previous page, there will be a inference engine underneath the hood that turns the crank and does all of the computation for you. Okay, so the programmer doesn't have to know about the details of probabilistic inference. They just have to understand what it means to write down this model. And then there is this magical engine underneath the hood that will give you back answers. So um, this is just a sort of a schematic diagram of what I walked through in the previous page. The basic idea is you construct the model, you have some observations. The details vary from engine to engine, but there's a lot of these out there now. One of them, this one is infer.net, which is developed at, at my lab. Um, and then the output is going to be the results of all of the infer statements that you sprinkle in here. Okay, and these outputs could be approximate marginal probabilities, they could be samples. Um, it doesn't particularly matter, different engines will have different ways of dealing with this. But in this case, let's imagine them as being samples from the model. Okay, so this is the sort of task that we're thinking about and I'm just going to abstract this a little bit and make it a bit simpler, but this covers in the full generality what we'll need to be able to do inside these inference engines. Um, the basic idea is we're given some function, think of it as a log probability distribution function that incorporates all of the observations that we've had so far. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to exponentiate, normalize this guy, get a probability distribution and then draw a sample. 
Okay, so supposing we have this inference engine, we write the model down, this all seems great so far. We go, we post this online, um, you know, put it on GitHub, and now the idea is that everybody in the world can use this and, you know, the world is a better place for having done this. Okay, there's, there's a big problem with the way that current systems work, and that's sort of the motivation behind what we're going to do here. So, if you look at the readme that needs to go inside this boss model, based on the current state of affairs with all of these probabilistic programming engines that are out there, you need to say this, this thing, sometimes it'll work and sometimes it won't work. What's more is that when it doesn't work, it still is going to output an answer. Um, and there's no way to tell if this answer is good or if this answer is bad. Um, and really, it could be arbitrarily bad. And so, you know, there's a lot of effort taking, for example, infer.net at Microsoft and Cambridge. Um, people have spent about 10 years trying to develop this. Some serious effort has gone into this, but still there isn't a notion of I've given you the right answer and I can prove it. Okay? So, you know, there's trade-offs here. Obviously, the, the, it's, it's a hard computational problem in the worst case. You're never going to be able to prove ahead of time that you're able to solve this. Um, but if you just think about this from what is trying to be achieved with probabilistic programming versus what is the technology offering, to me there's this huge clash here. You know, this, this just, uh, you know, imagine what happens if you try to use this. The thing fails, it tells you, I'm sure your boss is gone, um, but, you know, in fact he's not. Okay, so, so right. So the proposal, the thing that I want to say is the aim that we should strive for, um, which is a compromise between what's possible to compute and what would be useful in this more general setting, is we still make this assumption that sometimes it will work and sometimes it won't work. I think we're never going to be able to avoid that without putting huge restrictions on <coughs> what types of models we're able to express. Um, but all that I want to say is when it doesn't work, it'll tell you it doesn't work, okay? And so then you can imagine inside your program, it throws an exception and then you can resort to some fallback reasoning. So in the boss example, I, I am told that the inference didn't work for whatever reason and I know just to stay late if I want to be safe. I can, I can fall back to some other way of making decisions. Okay, so let's look at the inference algorithms in a bit more detail, what's out there. Um, so what we'd like to do is we'd like to have inference algorithms that draw samples from probability distributions and guarantee some form of exactness in this way that I'm uh, saying in the previous slide, which is it may run forever, but at least if it, if it does run and it gives you an answer, you know the answer is correct. Okay, so there's uh, two traditional classes of how to do this. So one of them is based on Markov chain Monte Carlo, and there's this idea called coupling from the past. What it basically says is it allows you to simulate uh, Markov chains starting from all possible starting positions, and then you keep running them until you prove that all of those chains have coalesced into uh, a, single, a single configuration. Um, and then at this point, you can guarantee that you have an exact sample. Um, and then the other approach is based on rejection sampling where you draw proposals from some simpler proposal distribution and then you compute a test, a random test to check whether you should accept this sample or not. And if this test tells you to accept, you know you've gotten the right answer. Okay, so what I want to add here is there's a different way of thinking about this problem and that's what I'm going to tell you about today. Okay? And so the, the starting point is this sort of simple probability trick that's kind of cute but not very practical it seems um, but we're going to take this and then we're going to develop into a sort of a bigger sampling algorithm. Okay, so I'll start by telling you about that. Uh, here's the basic idea of how the technical part will go. Uh, the first thing that I'll do is I'll tell you about what is this Gumbel Max trick. Um, then I'll talk about the Gumbel Max trick is for simple discrete distributions with a small set of possible options, and I'll show how to generalize this to uh, continuous distributions or exponentially large discrete spaces if you're interested. Um, and then I'll talk through the details of sort of what are, the, what are the necessary pieces here and then finally present the algorithm at the end. Okay, 
So let's talk about the Gumbel Max trick. But first, what I want to do is tell you a bit about this probability distribution, which is called the Gumbel distribution. Uh, it comes from extreme value statistics, but it has some really interesting properties. Um, but first off, what is it? Um, you know, it looks kind of like most other distributions <laughs> you've seen before. It's got a heavier tail on the upside. So if you draw samples from this, you're more likely to get really large values. Um, and you're less likely to get small values. And the PDF for this is this double exponential form. Uh, the CDF looks something just like having this exponential form here, or double exponential form. Um, and then just a practical point, if you want to sample a gumbel, it has a location parameter for our purposes here, which is M. If you want to sample a gumbel with this location value, what you do is you generate a uniform number using RAND. And then you take the negative log of the negative log of the uniform distribution and then add the location parameter to it. OK. So this has some interesting properties, this distribution. It's something that's called max stable. Um, so you might know the Gaussian distribution if you take the sum of two Gaussian uh, random variables, which you'll get back as a Gaussian. So it's sort of. Uh, it's, it stays closed under addition. The Gumbel distribution is closed under maximization. So it's sort of the max analog in this setting. Um, so a bit more specifically, let's just say that you have two Gumbel values, G1 and G2, drawn from a Gumbel with location zero. Then the max of these two is going to be distributed as Gumbel with location equal to log <coughs> two. And so I'll even prove this one for you. Um, so the, the point of this is just to show that these properties arise from simple manipulation of the probability density function. So we want to define this random variable z, which is the max of g1 and g2. What's the probability that z is less than some value g? Well, it's just the product of the probabilities that each of the original variables were less than this value. Then we take the CDFs of the Gumbel distribution, multiply them together. So this is the CDF of one Gumbel. This is the CDF of another Gumbel. You can then combine these together and get two of those. And then all we're going to do is try to move this uh, two to be inside this exponent. So we take the exp of a log, and then we move this inside, and then we get an exp of a negative exp of a log two in here. And then this is the location parameter of the Gumbel. And so this is a Gumbel with log two. Okay, um, another really interesting property that Gumbel distributions have is if you look at what is the probability that one Gumbel drawn variable is the argmax amongst a set of Gumbel random variables, then it behaves like a softmax. So if we have, again, if we now have a Gumbel drawn with a location equal to phi one, another Gumbel with location equal to phi two, then the probability that the first gumbel is bigger than the second one is this uh, familiar expression you've probably seen before, which is the softmax. I won't prove this one, but it follows in the same way. You can sort of write down the expression for what it is, that it's the argmax, compute an integral, and you get back to this. OK, so there's um, one more sort of more general version of this, um, which is not so <laughs> hard to see given uh, what I've told you so far. And that is, now let's suppose that we have a set of variables, more than two of them, that are drawn independently in Gumbel distributed. And each one has, uh, OK, so each of these GIs is going to be a Gumbel with location 0. And then we want to know what is the distribution of the argmax over any subset of these indices B. And this is going to be the softmax restricted to the elements that are inside the subset. This just follows from what I told you before. Um, and similarly, the max within any subset is going to be distributed as a log sum x, a gumbel with location equal to log sum x of the elements of the subset. OK, and then last property of the gumbel distribution is I've told you what are the distributions of the max and what are the distributions of the argmax. It turns out also that these quantities are independent. So that is to say that if I wanted to have a subset 
of these random variables that were Gumball distributed with some location, and I wanted to know what was the max and what was the argmax of this set, I could actually just sample these separately from these two distributions. So I could say, okay, first I'm going to choose the argmax according to a softmax distribution, and then I'm going to choose the max as a Gumball with location equal to the log sum x of the quantities that it went into it. And these don't have to communicate. So this is just a plot to show you here. For example, I'm, I just simulated here um, three different phi values here and said, what's the probability of the value of the max given that the argmax was equal to zero, probability of the max given that the argmax was equal to one, probability of the max given that the argmax was equal to two. It says these location parameters were different, but the distribution over the max given that you chose one of these to be the argmax does not change. Okay, so what is the Gumbel max trick? Now it seems quite trivial uh, given that we know all of this stuff, but so the, the problem description is we're given these phi's, which you can think of as negative energies or unnormalized log probabilities. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to sample from this softmax distribution where we exponentiate these guys, normalize, and then sample from that distribution. The Gumbel max trick has two steps. Uh, you say for each of those elements i, you generate a random Gumbel variable uh, with location zero. And then all you're going to do is return the argmax of the phi value plus the Gumbel random variable that you've drawn. And this will give you an exact sample from the softmax distribution. And people call this the Gumbel max trick. Okay, so now let's think about continuous distributions. So far I've said you have a set of k independent Gumbel random variables. You can see how you can use this to sample from these simple discrete distributions. Now what happens if we want to use the same idea but we want to sample from continuous distributions? So the sort of first questions to ask here are is there, what does it mean to perturb space? So we can think of, we had, in the discrete case, we had these values phi for each of the discrete values, one through k, and we then added this perturbation, which was this gumbled noise on top of them, and then this, this system had the property that the argmax was a sample from the distribution that we cared about. So if we think about continuous space, what needs to happen is we're going to have a continuous function, which is a log on normalized probability density function, and then we're going to, in some sense, add independent perturbations to each point in space, and then we're gonna ask what does this mean and how do we work with this object? Uh, and then the second thing is, once we've shown that such an object makes sense to think about, how do you actually perform this maximization to uh, find the argmax of this perturbed function? Okay, so just to sort of make it clear, the setting we're in now, it's we're, we basically have the same idea. We're given this phi, but now phi is a, a function over continuous space, and it can take a vector of real values, and then we want to sample from uh, the same Gibbs distribution here. Okay, so what are the analogs that we want? Um, the, the sort of, it turns out the analog that is useful for us to think about is to take this last property that I told you about, about what was the distribution of the max and the argmax in any subset. And so let's think about what that would mean in continuous space. So this is just this set of equations that I showed you before. It says that the max, the argmax in any subset is distributed as a softmax restricted to that subset. And the distribution of the max is, oops, this should say gumbel here, uh, with a gumbel with location equal to log sum x plus the, this. So all we're going to do here is we're going to replace the sums with integrals. So what we would like is we would like that the argmax is distributed as the Gibbs distribution, this restricted to be within the subset, and then we would like the max to be distributed as, let's just say Gumbel again, uh, with location equal to the log integral of the exponentiated density function uh, within this region. Uh, and so, right, so then we did a little bit of looking around in the statistics literature and whatnot, and we found such an object. Um, so there's this 
this master's thesis, which has the definition of sort of a more general structure than this. They call them max fields. Um, but so we specialize this to deal with gumballs and um, with, with, when the specialization deals with gumballs, we're calling it a gumball process. And so this is the sort of continuous analog um, of the object that we want to think about. Sorry, I, I think I used a macro for gumball and didn't realize that it wasn't working. Um, okay, so what is a gumball process? So we're going to be given this um, measure, which is just going to say uh, we're given some region B and we want to return what is the measure of this region. This is going to be the integral of the exponentiated phi function that I was telling you about before. Um, and then we're going to say that we're defining a random variable for each region of space B. Um, and then the gumball <coughs> process is going to be a collection of these random variables for each measurable subset uh, if these three properties hold. Um, so the first one is the marginal distribution that for every subset, the marginal distribution over a subset of the max is distributed as gumball with log measure of that region. Um, the disjoints, the independence of disjoint sets, which says if you have two independent subsets, the distribution of their max is independent. Uh, and then finally, there's this consistency constraint, which just says that if you have a random variable for subset A, a random variable variable for subset B, uh, then the random variable assigned to the union of these spaces needs to be equal to the max over the random, vari random variable assigned to each of these component subsets. So this just says, you know, you can think of it as that it's consistently assigning values to all regions of space, and it's, if you take any subset and look at the max, it's not going to contradict what you've looked at somewhere else. Okay, um, so maybe sort of as an example to think about, let's go back to this discrete case. What is the gumball process for this case where we just have um, discrete variables one through k? Uh, the gumball process is just going to be the distribution assigned to all subsets of those uh, random variables. So we can construct, the, we, could, we could actually instantiate this whole gumball process in the discrete case by saying let's sample the gumball value for each of the base components. Um, and then what we're going to have is, in order to construct the value of any subset, we're just going to take the max over the values that we've sampled for the base components of the subset. Okay. Yes. Um, so we're modeling it more as a Poisson process type thing. So in the Poisson process, you're assigning these counts to each region. And so we're, it's sort of the analog here is you're assigning a max to each region. Um, not sure about the Gaussian process case. Okay, um, hopefully that's clear enough. Is there any questions at this point? Okay. Um, so right, so now we have this mathematical object. Let's think about how can we actually construct it or how can we usefully generate samples from it. Well, by analogy to the discrete case, what you might think to do is let's do it in what we call a bottom-up manner, which is to say first instantiate the perturbations for all points in space and then from those deterministically construct the uh, value for all subsets. Um, yeah, it sort of makes sense. It's okay to think of that intuitively, but you'll never be able to execute this because the first step is generate infinitely many random variables. So the way we're going to go about doing this instead, the idea here is that, well, we don't need to instantiate all of these um, random variables. Uh, let's think about instead just instantiating the largest ones first. And so what do I mean by this? I mean, Let's start generating values by saying, let's first generate the location and the gumball value for the maximum across all of space. And then conditional upon that, let's divide up space somehow and say, let's sample the largest uh, value and the location of that largest value in this region, conditional upon having already drawn the largest value over all of space. 
and then let's recursively divide up space and proceed in doing this. Um, so let me show this in pictures. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to generate in some sense the largest values and their locations from this Gumbel process. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to first pick the point in space that is assigned the largest value. But what I told you from the definition of the Gumbel process is we actually know what the distribution of this thing is, right? I told you uh, what is the distribution of the max and what is the distribution of the argmax. And these are just uh, distributed according to the, the Gibbs distribution equations I showed you before. So you can say the value of the largest Gumbel is just going to be a Gumbel with location equal to the log measure of all of space. Uh, and then the x value, uh, sorry, yeah, the x value is just drawn according to the Gibbs distribution, and then the value associated with it is drawn according to a gumbel with this. And then we can think of this as we've instantiated these infinitely many random variables, and we've looked for where was the largest one and what was its value, and that's this guy. So now what we need to do is we need to recurse. So what we're going to do is we're going to split space up. We'll choose to divide it into B and B complement. So we'll remove this one point from space, and then we'll say, now let's look at just this region here to the left. Now, we know what is the distribution marginally of, um, of the, the largest value, the largest location in this region of space B. And that's just going to be distributed according to this Gibbs distribution, restricted to be in the subset. Uh, and then the value that it's going to have, you can work it out, is it's not quite a Gumbel distribution, but it's a Gumbel distribution truncated to be no larger than the value that you've drawn already before. Um, so what this allows us to do is say, okay, we've drawn the largest value in all of space. Now let's look at some different region of space B and let's draw the largest value in this region of space and uh, its location, okay? And then what we can do is we can continue this, we can divide up space. It always is of the form that we're going to draw the location from a Gibbs distribution restricted to some region of space and the actual value associated with a point is going to be a truncated gumbel. Okay, so we now have the ability to do somewhat um, reasonable computation. We don't have to generate infinitely many random variables. Uh, we haven't really gained anything at this point. Um, so let's just, yeah, let's look at this slide. So, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, there's, the, uh, independent subsets have dis independent uh, values, right? So you could think of this, you could think of generating things in the bottom up way where you divide space up into as many tiny little regions as you want and you draw independent random variables for each region of space to be the max in that region. Um, and so it will, there's no smoothness or anything like that. Um, so the definition of a Gumbel process will necessarily not be smooth. So, um, okay, um, right, so to recap where we're at. So we started off saying we're trying to sample from these probability distributions and we said, okay, let's think about a strange object, which the optimum of this uh, is a sample from the distribution that we care about. But then when I've just told you about how to actually work with this, um, the first step was sample from the distribution that we cared about. Okay, so we haven't gained anything here. We've just said, here's a different way of, of thinking about what's going on, but we haven't gained anything from a computational perspective. Um, so the next step, the reason, the, the way to make this actually do something is uh, what I'm going to tell you about now. And the inspiration is going to come from proposal distributions in projection sampling. 
Okay, so we were given this phi function, which is our large probability density function we care about. What we're going to do is we're going to split it up into a sum of two components. One of them we're calling i because you need to be able to integrate it tractably, uh, and o because you need to optimize or bound, upper bound it tractably. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to pull out um, some part that we know how to work with analytically, and then there's going to be some remainder part that we're going to need to be able to compute upper bounds on. Um, right, and so what we're going to require is that we can instantiate this process that I just told you before for the I component. So we need to be able to compute these log volumes that I was telling you about and sample from restricted regions of space. Okay, so I'll just tell you the steps here. So let's think about a different Gumbel process now where the measure is based on just the tractable, just the proposal part of this, the part that we're able to integrate. Um, we can now run this procedure that I told you about where we start by generating the maximum and then we recursively divide up space and generate the maximums within regions just for this I part. And what we'll get is we'll get this stream of values which are the gumbo values and the locations at which they occur. And then the key thing that, I'm not gonna prove it, but the key property that comes out here is what we can do is we can come in, we can take these values and we can look at what is the leftover part at the locations that we've drawn. And if we go and we add that to the gumbo values, then what we get back is we get something that is like a gumbo process for the original distribution that we cared about. Um, it's just these points are not necessarily in any sort of sorted order anymore because uh, these O's can potentially change what is the ordering of the values. Okay, so here's an attempt to explain this in pictures. Um, so this is what we started off caring about. This is a gumbo process distributed according to this full phi function that we cared about. This was the tractable <coughs> gumbo process that we um, instantiated just from the I component of this. And we said that we're, we know how to generate these spikes uh, for different regions of space from this I one. And then what we can do is we can come for each point in space, compute, this is the O function, this was the part that we left over, you say it looks like this gray line, and we can come and we can move these according to the I. So this length here is meant to be equivalent to this length here, this length here is meant to be equivalent to this length here, and all we've done is we've added O of X to all of the values that we got out here. Um, and so you can see this, that you know this was the largest value in the original gumbo process, once we come in and we add these O's, it might rearrange things, so now this becomes the largest value. Um, and then what I just told you is that these two things are equivalent in the distribution that they impose. Okay, so we can think of a Gaussian pro a gumbo process in both ways, and it's going to be, thinking about it this way is going to make the optimization uh, make some sense. Okay, so now we're ready to tell you about the algorithm. Um, the algorithm that we're going to use here is going to be A star search. So A star search is this algorithm from heuristic search. I don't know when it came out, the 60s maybe. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to search over space for the maximum of this Gumbel process. And we're going to do it by guiding the regions that we explore according to some upper bound. So we're gonna have this upper bound that says, uh, for each region of space, what's the largest value that we could possibly find here? And then we're going to explore that region. In doing this, we're gonna divide up space further, compute new upper bounds, and we're gonna keep doing the search until we have provably found the maximum of this thing. Okay, so where does the upper bound come from? Um, I told you from the last slide, this is the tractable samples from the, the, the samples from the tractable gumbo process and then we have this O function that we're adding. And so the objective that we have is the sum of these two terms. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this bound where this, the maximum of the sum over some region of space is going to be bounded by the sum of the maximum of 
the two terms. Okay, so there's the component here, which is just now the gumbel values from the tractable part, and then a term here, which is just a function of this leftover part. Okay, and then the, the reason for doing this is these, these are both easy to compute. So the maximum value of a gumbel from the tractable part in a region is just that value that we've sampled associated with the original gumbel process. And then in order to compute an upper bound on this O function for some region of space, we resort to all of the methods people know about in machine learning where you use convexity or you use, uh, there are interval methods. There's various ways of coming up with bounds on functions. We're quite good at that. <coughs> okay, so let's see an execution of how this is going to work. Um, so here's this O function and then what we're going to do is we're going to start off by drawing the location and the gumbel value for the maximum in the tractable gumbel process. So this is the largest noise value for the, the I part. And then what we're going to do is from here we can compute an upper bound. So the upper bound is going to be this guy, this length here, which is the maximum of the noise part, plus some upper bound over the O function over all of space. So we need, we need to implement this somehow. But once we've done that, then we, we can compute this global upper bound. Then what we're going to do is we're going to remove this point from consideration, split up space into two parts, recompute the upper bounds for both regions. So these guys are the new upper bounds. And we've also now drawn the maximum noise part for each of these regions, conditional upon having drawn this part. And now A star tells us that we should look for the region with largest upper bound, which is here. And then we're going to explore this region. And so how's that going to work? Um, well, we're going to compute a lower bound, which is the O function plus this noise part. And then, um, oh, I, right. So this is a bit out of order, but that's how the upper bound was computed. It's just what I said before. It's the noise part plus we now have some method to bound the O function, but only in this region of space. So we might be able to improve our bounds by restricting attention just to some subregion. Um, and now what we're going to do is we're going to split up space again. In each of these regions of space, we're going to draw what is the largest noise part. So this guy in this part, this guy in this part, recompute the upper bounds. And now what we can see is that we have a point here which has a function value of the O plus the I, which is greater than the upper bound over all the rest of space. And so at this point, we've proved that we've found the global maximum of the gumbel process that we cared about. And this is an exact sample from the distribution of interest. Okay. Um, right, uh, here's the actual algorithm. I think we don't need to go through it. The, the point is just that there is a priority queue it's going to have priorities which are things like the sums of the G is the gumbel values, the M's are the bounds in regions of space. It's really not that hard to implement. It's you, you just have to write your functions that compute these bounds and that draw the samples and compute the volumes. And then from there, it's, it's like any other search that you learn about in your first AI course. Okay, um, just to lay out there, what are the components that you need? So you have to define this initial region, which could potentially have an infinite extent. Um, you need a strategy for splitting up space. So here it was just uh, sort of regions of space. In general, we've just been playing with hyper rectangles, but maybe you could do something more interesting. Um, you need a function that's able to sample from the proposal distribution restricted to any region that you're going to encounter in your search. You need a function that computes the log vol the volume, sorry, the, the volume of the exponential of the proposal uh, for any region of space. And then you need to be able to compute these upper bounds. Um, and that's about it. And then from this, you can run this algorithm and you'll get an exact sample. Um, oh, right, it also works in the discrete setting. So for example, if you wanted to use this for Ising models, you could say that your initial region is now um, product space of n binary variables a function that divides up space, you might condition on each possible value of a random dimension that you haven't looked at before. Uh, your proposal distribution might be a tree structure distribution where you can use some product to sample and compute uh, partition functions. Uh, and then 
For your upper bounds, you can use your favorite upper bounding technique from discrete map inference. So you can use linear program bounds or anything else that you like. OK. Um, how am I doing on time? 15. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll say, I think I'll skip this part, um, but the, I'll, I'll sort of say quickly, there is a close connection to rejection sampling, if you know this. Um, so um, one result is that if you use plain old rejection sampling where you have the same proposal distribution that you're using throughout all of your proposals and you just keep using it uh, until you find a sample to accept, that's equivalent to a very bad version of A star sampling where you start with some upper bound on this O function and then you never refine it as you uh, continue to search through the tree. And so we can show that you have exactly the same runtime uh, as rejection sampling. In this case. Um, when you do refine the bounds, there is another algorithm called OS star which uses exactly the same components. It uses these upper bounds over regions of space and it uses the same style of proposal distribution where you first choose a region and then you choose a point within that region to propose. Um, and there's, there is a close relationship to this algorithm as well except it's not equivalent and A star sampling actually gives you something that's more efficient than this algorithm. So there's some subtleties about exactly how the randomness is used uh, that makes it work a bit better. Um, I'm going to skip this detailed comparison between the two algorithms, but I can tell you more about this after if you're interested. Um, right, the, the end takeaway is that uh, this OSR algorithm looks exactly the same. You implement exactly the same functions, but we get something that's moderately more efficient in the sense that this OS star algorithm tends to use 20 to 40% more computation than A star sampling. Okay, so let me just show you a couple experiments. Um, okay, the first thing that we did is we looked at probably the simplest problem you can think about, which is estimating the mean of a Gaussian from n observations. Um, so how does this look? The proposal distribution is just a prior, so this is the uh, unnormalized log PDF of a zero mean Gaussian prior. The observations here are xi stars, and so this O is going to be the sum of the contributions from each data point that we've seen. Uh, and then we play around with different bound functions. So what we're looking at here is what are the different strategies for computing these bounds and how does this affect the performance of the algorithm. Um, so this UI function can be filled in in three different ways. Um, what we're going to do, if we have a constant bound, we're just going to say for each point i independently, let's look what is the maximum value of this term inside a region here, which is just saying, you know, so we have this quadratic, it's bounded in some region, and we just say what is the maximum value there, and then we're going to add all of these up to get these what we call constant bounds. Linear bounds, what we do is we say in a region, let's look at the maximum value in a region and put a linear upper bound on this quadratic there, and then let's say that our total bound is the sum, it's the it's optimizing over the linear function, which is the sum of linear bounds at each data point. Uh, and then the quadratic bound here is just computing the exact upper bound of this function. And the basic takeaway here is that here's the number of data points that you have. The blue is, so this is, uh, let's just look at, say, how many bound evaluations you need. That's the solid lines. Um, the growth here is, it sort of, it looks like it's somehow polynomial in the, the um, suboptimality of these bounds, which is actually a lot better than uh, rejection sampling based approaches. You pay a lot worse in the suboptimality of bounds. Um, another thing we looked at is this comparison between OS star, and so here we have a, a Bayesian regression setting where we have a, a heavy-tailed noise model, which gives us back this problem where we have a multimodal posterior and we're trying to sample um, the weights. And what we've done here is we've, we've taken two versions of this OS star algorithm. This is the square and the diamond. And we've also added this additional parameter that allows us to trade off how expensive it 
how many bound evaluations we need to use and how many likelihood evaluations or O evaluations that we need to use. And what you see is you can sort of move around here. The x-axis is how much cost we spend on the likelihood evaluations. The y-axis is how much we spend on bound evaluations. These red lines are sort of equa computational cost. And what you see here is that there's this regime at which A star operates, which is better and dominates this rejection sampling based stuff, or adaptive rejection sampling based algorithms. Um, and then just very quickly, to return to this probabilistic programming setting, we looked at, can we use this in a more generic setup? So we went online and we found this branch and bound library, which had implemented uh, this method where you give it a symbolic expression that describes your PDF function, and then it will give you upper bounds for this function. And then we can use this to have nonlinear regression, to, to do nonlinear regression in many different settings. So this is saying that the model is y is equal to parameter a times some function x is your input, and then you have these other parameters. So a through f are the parameters of your model. Uh, and it's very easy to just plug this in. So this required no uh, problem-specific code here. It's just the user could write down this symbolic expression, and then what we're able to get back is exact samples. Okay, so I think I'll just wrap up there, saying that, um, so just to recap, we've taken this Gumbel Max trick. We've said, what happens in continuous space? Um, can we think about a sampling algorithm based on that? And it actually gives both a new way of thinking about the sampling problem and an algorithm that seems to be more efficient than uh, the alternative, the, the sort of the most closely matched comparator. Okay, so then I'll just leave here the sort of ideas looking forward. I'll take questions. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, right, so I imagine this works by you set a timeout. So uh, this algorithm runs for one minute. If it hasn't found an answer, uh, then it just returns, I failed. Um, so we've, we, maybe the, the question here relates to what distribution are you sampling from if you stop early? Um, and so we've looked at this, but so you can run this algorithm and you can say, I found some lower bound which has improved over the course of running this algorithm. And if I haven't proved that it's optimal, but I just return it, how, what, what's happening? Um, and we see this qualitative behavior that the longer you run it, it sort of moves smoothly towards the distribution uh, that we're interested in, but we haven't been able to analyze exactly what this means. Um, so that's a, that's a question. I'm not sure what the answer is. So in, how does it scale to higher dimensions? Which ah. Yes. So it scales quite poorly in the dimension. Um, so you can come up with simple examples like if I'm trying to sample from, if I'm trying to sample uniformly from a hypersphere and I have a hyper rectangular bounding regions, then you do no better in this case than just plain old rejection sampling, which is exponentially bad in the dimension. Um, and that's just because <laughs> sort of trying to, it's these, this geometry of high dimensional spheres where if you try to carve up space with rectangles, then there will always be, pretty much always be some, rec some part of the sphere inside the rectangle, but it would always be exceedingly small amount of the rectangle that has any sphere inside of it. Um, and so this means that you can't improve the bounds. The bounds don't help you because the upper bound of your function within some region uh, is actually just, it's high. Um, but if you were trying to hit this with your proposal distribution, you're never gonna hit it. So what's gonna happen is your bounds are gonna basically stay the same throughout all of this. You're gonna generate a bunch of locations. They're all going to have really bad lower bounds. 
and you're just never going to hit the sphere. Uh, wait, so say that again. You want to run so MCMC you first? Run MCMC chain for many steps, yeah. You will decorrelate. Yeah. And you will basically have an exact sample as well. Many yeah. Steps are almost exact. Sorry? Many steps. <laughs> yeah, many, many steps. Infinite steps. But yeah. you know, yeah, the point is that you get very close to being exact fairly quickly if you just traverse from one end of the distribution to the other. Mm -hmm. It's a good question. Um, so I guess in my view, the um, the sort of the style of exact sampling that deals with MCMC is this coupling from the past style ideas. Um, I haven't thought about whether we could sort of revisit MCMC with this mindset and try to formulate what's happening in MCMC in these terms. I don't know. Uh, it's not obvious to me that that's possible, but it's an interesting problem to think about. Maybe ask a more high-level question. Um, it came up both in Max's talk and your talk about we all seem to believe that modeling uncertainty is important, but it's also very, very complicated. So I'm wondering more from a Microsoft perspective, this whole sort of .NET challenge about really trying to bring this programming to the masses. How does that go? And what are the challenges? And, uh, yeah, so I'd say this, the way I see it, um, <coughs> is probabilistic programming kind of has two faces. I think one of them is this story that I've pushed here, which is we want the masses to have probabilistic models. Um, and then there's huge challenges, which is even if you solve all the inference things, how do you get people to know what these models mean? How do you get people, you know, the average programmer to, to write down a meaningful model or a good model? Um, but then there's the second view of probabilistic programming, which is it's just a tool to help the experts build their models faster. So it sort of allows this rapid prototyping of, I can add this one extra component and I don't even have to go in and change my code. Uh, I can just press go and I'll get back a reasonable answer. And an expert is able to deal with these problems of inference may fail and they can recognize when it is. Um, so there's, there's a perfectly good use case for it, which is just improve the productivity of the experts. And I think that's what, I guess if I'm thinking what's valuable to Microsoft, that to this point is what is valuable. Um, so I think you know these people who are highly trained in building the inference algorithms can then service or help a much wider group of people by having this unified view. time for lunch and the poster sessions and uh, then we'll decide what to do after that. Bon appétit. Um, but actually most of the talk is about previous work uh, that we did on another conversion application of image to noise in. Uh, and we'll see uh, how far we get through this talk. It's George work with Daniel Salah who used to be still in his department, and Dan Rodenbaum, who's still a student here. So we've talked a lot throughout this day about the importance of modeling uncertainty in artificial intelligence. Uh, and one example of that in computer vision is where there's this problem called natural inspires, where many people are interested in the following problem given and then by a matrix, it's called X, return the probability of X, the probability that X is a natural image. And there's a lot of debate about what it means, the probability of natural images. Uh, 
but just at least at this point is a heuristic. We want, we, we want this function to say that this is very likely to be a natural image, this is less likely, uh, and this is highly unlikely. Does anybody know what this is? It's a seismic image. So this is uh, an image that's formed by cr doing small explosions on the ground and measuring how the, um, how the sound is reflected, how the explosion is reflected using geophones. Um, okay, so this is a, an interesting sort of fundamental research problem. One of the applications of this problem is in this problem of image restoration. So if you're given a noisy image, such as the one you see here, um, and you'd like to create a clean image, so if we denote by x the clean image, uh, y the noisy image, if we could learn the probability over clean images, p of x, we could use our image prior and Bayes rule to estimate probability of x given y. And one of the uh, reasons uh, we were interested in this problem as uh, machine learning and graphical models people is that um, on the one hand, it seems like a very natural application of machine learning uh, because now we can train systems with many, many examples of clean images uh, to improve the denoising performance. But when you look at the literature of how people do image denoising, there are two classes of methods. Uh, one is called prior-based. And those are the kinds of methods that we, as machine learning people, really like, spe specifically people who do uncertainty in AI really like. And what these methods do, do is they're given a training set of possible images. So here you see all sorts of examples of, of images. And then you use this image and you feed it into a learning machine that estimates a prior of the natural images. And then during runtime, it uses this prior and the noisy image to denoise the image. And then the other set of methods are, you know, th this is an important engineering problem, image denoising. So many people have engineered systems to do this for many years. Um, and so those methods don't really use a training set. They don't have an explicit notion of what a natural image looks like. Uh, they're just sort of systems that were designed by hand in order to solve the problem. And what do you think works best? Yes. So, at least until our work, it was very depressing that the methods that work better are the second type of method. And you could argue, is there really such a thing as a prior free method? Um, it's a sort of semantic, but let me just sh show you one example of a system that works very well. It's called block matching 3D, or BM3D. And what it does is it takes a noisy image like the one you see here. It extracts a noisy patch from the image. It searches within the image for similar noisy patches in the same image. And then it takes all of these, and it's, this is why it's called 3D, it, it makes a three-dimensional data structure where you stack up all these blocks, one on top of each other, and you use something like a nonlinear, uh, like a median filter over the stack, and that gives you this result. So there's no learning, it doesn't need a training set, it works equally well for seismic images or for, actually for sound. Uh, for auditory signals as it does for images. There's no training set, there's no learning, and it works very well. And this is very disturbing to us, and just to compare it maybe to a more, what I would like to think should work better, uh, this is the field of experts method, which is what I would call a prior-based method. Um, it actually explicitly has a training set. It explicitly builds a probabilistic model of, this, of what a natural image should look like. It's a parametric model says that the probability of an image is one over z, e to the minus, the sum of, over a bunch of filters, uh, rho, which is a nonlinear function applied to the image. And so it's actually, set, it has an explicit probabilistic model that says let me optimize the parameters of this, uh, do maximum likelihood of this model over the training set, and that should work better, we would like to think, than these hand-designed methods uh, that don't even have a training set, and they're just based on some uh, engineer's heuristic for how to denoise an image. And so this is unfortunately not a subtle effect. So um, this is a comparison that Daniel did. There were 100 different test images. He compared BM3D versus this fields of experts method. BM3D worked better 100 out of 100 times. So it's really not a very subtle effect. Uh, there is another method called KSVD, uh, which is very similar to fields of experts, but with a different uh, probabilistic model behind it. 
Um, and the game of 3D works better 89 of the 100 times. So again, not a very subtle effect. And it's, it's not just you know, numbers. When I say works better, you, know, you can compare to the original image and measure which one gives higher, lower mean squared error. You can also see it in your eyes. So this is an example of a noisy image. Uh, this is how, what happens when you denoise it with the fields of experts model. So let me just go back and forth. So you see the field of experts model does a very good job of getting rid of the noise, uh, but it also gets rid of a lot of the signals. So for example, the fur on the chipmunk and the um, texture on the, um, on, the, on the stone is also removed by the same method. And then this is the block matching 3D, which is again, does not, never learn what natural images are like, doesn't have an explicit probabilistic model. Uh, and it's, it's just, you know, it, you can see it with your eyes, it works better. It maintains, it, both of these methods get rid of a lot of the noise, uh, but the BM3D does a much better job of maintaining the signal. Okay, so this was very disturbing to us. <laughs> and you can think of different reasons for why that is. Um, one possible solution is that this idea of training um, a prior over natural images is the wrong thing to do. Maybe there's no such thing as a probable distribution over natural images. Maybe we should separate you know, images of, say, people from images of buildings, and learn separate things for every one of these classes. Uh, there are other issues that have to do with the, um, with the approximations that were made here, as uh, Max mentioned in the first talk, the bad news about probabilistic models that are very hard to compute with. You have to use all sorts of approximations. So maybe that was the problem. Um, other people, this is related to the original title of my talk, other people took this thing and said it's the problem is that we're using probabilities instead of neural networks and tried to train a neural network to solve the same task. And these are all uh, interesting ideas, but what we now understand following um, Daniel's work is that it's just that the the, me the, the probabilistic methods, the prior based methods that were used were simply not very good methods, even in the likelihood sense. And a simple unconstrained Gaussian mixture model, which is really something anyone who did our introduction to machine learning class could implement, a first year undergrad, uh, gave state of the art performance. So I wanna talk a little bit more through this result and think about what this means as we think more generally about how to use the tools of machine learning in image applications. Um, but so this is the, just to show you how well this very simple method works, the Gaussian mixture model method. Um, this is the original noisy image. This is what we saw earlier with the field of experts. And this is with this Gaussian mixture model, which I, I'll explain a little bit how it works. But again, if you go back and forth, whereas the fields of experts gets rid of a lot of the signal and the texture, the Gaussian mixture model, which is explicitly trained to try to model what natural images look, for, look like, does a much better job of understanding that things like texture in fur are real and things like texture in, in stones are real. So going back to this original thing, uh, so if we had 100 different test images, now when we compare BM3D to GMM, the GMM is better 81 of the 100 times. Um, and I think one nice thing that then I think came up both in Max's talk and in Danny's talk, when you have a probabilistic model, uh, you can use what you've learned to do more than one task. You can use it for any particular kind of application. So the, image we, uh, the images I showed you earlier, the task was given a noisy image, make a clean image, a slightly perhaps more common cost today when people have these very cheap cell phone cameras they often move the phone while they're taking the, camera, the picture, and so the image is a little bit blurred, uh, like you see over here. And we can use the same formulas and the same prior probability we've learned over images, just change the likelihood function to solve this task. So let me just show you, this is the original blurred image. Of course, it's very blurred. Um, this is sort of the state of the art. It's actually work based, previous state of the art. It's based on the work of my former student, Anat Levine is now at the Weizmann, uh, which uses a hand-designed, uh, it, it has a very simple parametric model of what images should be like, um, and uses that, and it, indeed it sharpens the image. It also introduces a lot of artifacts. I'm not sure how well you can see 
from where you're sitting, but for example, over here, um, it doesn't quite look natural. It kind of looks like some, some processing was done on the image. And this is the Gaussian mixture model. Again, it sharpens the image, but it also does a much more believable job because it has a better idea of what natural images should look like. Um, and we've, we have numbers that show that really this is a significantly better result than the state of the art, even though it was never trained to solve this particular task. It was just trained to try to model what natural images should look like. Okay, uh, so let me just uh, try to see, I don't know how many of you are interested in particular image restoration, but what did we learn from this task, um, from the story? So, again, if you look at the fields of experts model, uh, it was a pure learning approach, but it just didn't work very well. Uh, the Gaussian mixture model is also a pure learning approach. It doesn't assume, it doesn't require an engineer to design a specific algorithm for a specific task, but it actually can yield state-of-the-art performance, and what's the secret? And I'll just go into that. There were two sort of design decisions that were made by Daniel. Uh, one is that modeling patches rather than full images. I'll explain exactly what that means. Uh, and the other, which is related again to the dis discussion we're going to have a little bit about neural networks and deep learning. Uh, the other thing we've learned from this is that learning can succeed when optimizing a non-convex function over many, many free parameters. And I'll go into these two bullets now. Yeah. It's exactly passion. Yeah, I'll go into this now. You'll see it. Yeah, it's very, very simple. Um, embarrassingly simple. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so the first decision we made, or Daniel made, is that um, what, what fields of experts and other people, including us, try to do is learn a function given a whole image. We'll say, what's the problem if this is a real image? And as Max was just saying, if you try to just fit this whole thing with the Gaussian mixture model, the dimension will just kill you. It's a you know, million dimensional uh, vector, so you need lots and lots of uh, data to estimate it, and computationally it's difficult. And instead of that, what we're going to do is we're going to take this image, divide it up into small patches, and so in, in this particular case, eight by eight patches. So basically, we have 64 dimensional vectors, that's all there is, and um, we just feed those into a Gaussian mixture model. But now we have a distribution over 64 dimensions, that is something that a mixture model can do very easily. And then the interesting thing is, okay, you've learned this distribution over patches. How do you actually go about denoising a full image? And the way he did it, Daniel, is we, he optimized this function, which has sort of a data term that says you want the image to be close to your observed image. And you also want every patch in the image to have high log probability under your learned model. Yes, even, this is a great point. So they're overlapping patches. And so that's what this point is, that this function is really not the correct probability of x given y. We're just summing up the log probability of every patch. And as someone who was trained in graphical models, this seemed like a terrible thing to do. Um, but it seems to work. This is one of the, uh, not only does it work in practice, it has this interesting fact that as we use different methods, so what's shown here are different probabilistic models of patches. This is the simplest model you could imagine. You just imagine every pixel was independent of the others. That gives, that's a probabilistic model, and you can evaluate its um, log likelihood on unseen patches, and that's what's shown in these green bar plots. So the higher this log likelihood is, the better your probabilistic model is at modeling the distribution, the density, over eight by eight image patches. And so of course, an independent pixel model is very bad. Uh, the next idea, which I think Max also mentioned, is you could try to get rid of some of the correlations between the pixels uh, by modeling as a multivariate Gaussian, and that does better in terms of log likelihood. And there's this model called ICA, or independent component analysis, and that does even better. It's not a Gaussian model, it's a nonlinear model. Um, and then this over here is the Gaussian mixture model, which just in terms of log likelihood does much better than the other models. Again, this is a log likelihood on, on held out patches. So of course, the Gaussian mixture model can have a lot more free parameters. So if you just uh, examined its log likelihood on the, on the training set, that wouldn't be very interesting. But this is on the test set. So this really does a better job of capturing the density. What's shown in the orange bars 
is the performance of this heuristic method over here in terms of image denoising. So even though we're summing up together log probabilities, even though things are not independent, you see that there's this very nice relationship between the better the probabilistic model is, the better is the performance at denoising full images. So there is something to this heuristic, and that's one of the things uh, we're doing now as we continue this research, is trying to formalize this relationship, try to understand why it is uh, that things seem to do better, even though they make this heuristic assumption that is wrong. Okay, the other thing that was crucial to make this work is really uh, the number of three parameters. Um, so the field of experts model, uh, it had these Ws that were tied, these convolutional structure. It had something like 600 free parameters, which five or 10 years ago, you would think that's, that would be considered a lot. 600 free parameters in a probabilistic model, that sounds like a lot. You know, we're used to you know, means and variances, three, four parameters, 600 already seemed like a lot. Uh, the Gaussian mixture model, you can do the calculation, has 200 covariance matrices for 64 dimensional things. So it's more than 400,000 free parameters. And you know, that seemed five or six years ago, that seemed a totally crazy thing to do. How much data would you need in order to estimate that amount of free parameters? And not only that, the way we learn these parameters is, is using the expectation maximization algorithm. Again, something we teach all our undergrad uh, students. We teach the students that this algorithm only converges to a local maximum. It's not a global optimization. So it's a very complicated uh, cost function that we're trying to uh, optimize in this 400,000 dimensional space. And yet it works. Really yes, performance is, is better. You, don't, I mean, you can do okay with 190, but it's better with 200 than with 190, yes. Um, in deep learning, you have Exactly, so, uh, well, we can do more, but, <laughs> but I think an interesting theoretical question, again, part of the idea of, these, of this talk is to motivate us to think of interesting theoretical questions that we should address in our research, both in deep, so yes, in deep neural networks, as I think, it depends who you ask, but you can easily get to billions of free parameters, and the, the cost function being optimized during learning is highly non-convex, <laughs> and yet it works very well. And there are people actually here in our department who are trying to, Shai Shalev Schwartz, and I guess Amit a little bit, who are trying to uh, address this question theoretically. Why is it that deep learning can work despite the non-convexity and the large number of parameters? And I would argue that we, we also theorists should think of a similar question about Gaussian mixture models. They do seem to work even with a tremendous amount of uh, parameters, far fewer than you would expect from a statistical standpoint. Uh, far, sorry, you, you don't have nearly enough data as you think you need to estimate that many free parameters, and it's very non-convex, and it still works very well. Okay, so one, you know, I, I said in the talk, I'll talk a little bit about both graphical models and a little bit about neural networks, and one question, and so we've, we've seen here the similarities. One, one similarity between these two approaches is that both of them use a lot of free parameters and use very non-convex optimization. Uh, but what are the advantages or disadvantages of both? And I think one big advantage of probabilistic models in general, and the Gaussian mixture model is a special case, is that you can uh, interpret the results. It's not a black box. You sort of know what the algorithm is learning. And the way to think of it is that really the, one way to think of a Gaussian is that it, um, it's a linear model, right? The eigenvector, when you generate from a Gaussian, you basically sample white noise and you multiply it by the square root of the covariance matrix, and that gives you samples from your data. And the way to think of a mixture model is that you have a number of these linear models, and you have a discrete variable that says which linear model is responsible for a particular data point. So here's a mixture model with just two components. Um, if k is equal to one, then you sample white noise and you multiply it by this basis. And if k is equal to two, you sample white noise and multiply it by that matrix. And there's a multinomial variable that says should you do k equals one or k equals two. So I think one interesting way of uh, visualizing what a Gaussian mixture model has learned is really to look at this, these different bases uh, and see what they've learned. And it turns out that uh, it's, it learns something very interesting. It learns um, that natural images tend to have occlusion and texture, which is exactly which is, of course, true. 
and it's something that the field of experts model really missed out on, it really didn't understand. So what's shown here on top are these basis elements. So every small patch you see here is a basis element for an eight by eight patch. And these are just numbers of components. I showed you earlier two possible components. This Gaussian mixture model has 200 possible components. I'm just showing you five of these possible bases. Uh, so maybe start with this one over here, number 37. Where's my pointer? Oh, well. uh, so number 37 on top, you see these Fourier coefficients. And as Max told us, when you see Fourier bases, that means there's some sort of translational symmetry in the distribution. And that's exactly what you expect from a texture. If you have a patch that's just textured, it's, it's, uh, it has some uh, stationarity assumptions. And indeed, if you look at all the samples in the bottom, then they're all, um, where are we over here? They're all vertical textures. So this particular Gaussian component understands that eight by eight patches often have this nice oriented texture. Um, if you look at component number 56, for example, which is a different component, it's the basis elements are basically have most of their energy just on the bottom, and they don't care what happens on top. And you can see this also in the samples. The sample is basically flat on top and have all sorts of interesting things happening in the bottom. And this is exactly what you would expect to happen at a, at a horizontal occlusion boundary, where you have one object occluding another object. And so one object has a lot of texture on it, and the background object that doesn't have texture. And again, this algorithm automatically learns that this is a thing that happens often in natural images. So I'll just go back um, to summarize. So what we've learned from uh, learning image priors is that pure learning approach can yield state-of-the-art performance. Well, in order to get it to work, we needed to do two things, to model patches rather than full images. And we need to sort of give in to this idea of going with high, very, very high dimensional problems and non-convex. And learning can succeed when optimizing a non-convex function over many, many free parameters. OK, so in the uh, remaining 10 minutes, I'll talk about um, the work of uh, Dan Rosenbaum, which is really more work in progress, uh, where we try to apply the same kind of um, the same kind of ideas to optical flow. This reminds me that um, I was invited recently to give a talk at the Israeli Statistical Society, and they wanted me to talk about the difference between statistics and machine learning. And there's a very nice paper by Larry Wasserman, if anyone's interested, who, which is exactly on this problem. What's the difference between statistics and machine learning? Uh, in short, one big difference is conferences. Uh, <laughs> He explains the conference culture is so different in CS than it is in that. And another one which he talks about, which is related, is that a, a machine learning graduate student will typically work on five to 10 different problems during his PhD and apply his, his same algorithm to a lot of different problems, whereas that's not true in statistics. Often in statistics, they will, if you do applied work, you focus on modeling a particular domain. And I think this is a strength of machine learning Going back to this talk, it's important if you have something that works well on one problem to try to apply it on a related problem because you learn a lot more than just working on one problem. So the problem of optical flow is given a pair of images, find a two-dimensional motion, u and v of every pixel. Uh, so the input is a pair of images like down here, and the output is an image where every image is basically two components. Here it's the, the two components are coded in a particular coding scheme. Um, so the more saturated the color is, uh, the, 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 the larger the speed is of this particular pixel. So all the pixels belonging to the car move faster than the uh, pixels belonging to the background. And uh, the chrominance, the hue of the pixels, is the direction of motion. But basically, your task is, given um, two images, find the speed and the direction of motion of every pixel. And this is a very well-studied problem, um, going back at least, so what is this, 35 years? Um, no? <laughs> um, and sort of the, and what Hoyn and Schunk and Nagel in, 19, in 1980 said is, we can solve this by inventing an energy function and finding its minimum. So this energy is a function of V, this velocity field. So think of the V as this unknown image. 
And you do it by, opti by minimizing and functioning those two terms, the smoothness term and the data term. Um, and just, you just optimize this thing, and you, uh, the smoothness just says nearby pixels should, have, should move similarly. And then the data term says if you take one image and you warp it according to the correct velocity field, uh, you should get exactly the first image. So there should be no difference between the first image and the warped version of the second image if you figured out the correct motion. And it's a bit embarrassing, but we are now 50, 35 years later, and this is still the state of the art in optical flow uh, methods. Our computers have gotten a lot faster, so we can minimize these functions much better, but basically these are still the state of the art. So our idea was, can we apply machine learning uh, and graphical models technology to this type of problem? And really the insight is that if you look at this, um, these two terms, you can think of them as image priors over these two images over here. So here are two images from a particular data set. This is the ground truth flow, and this is what we call the flow warp error. This is the difference between the, the first image and what happens when you warp the second image according to the flow. So maybe this is, let me just go into this, this is a bit less intuitive. What you expect to see is that the, if you subtract these two images, you'll get zero everywhere. But that's not true at the occlusion boundaries. At the occlusion boundaries, even if you warp according to the original flow, you'll get an error because there's stuff there in the first image that will simply disappear in the second image. There's no way for you to make it up. So you have these two images, and really these are two, you can think of, the, of this cost function as a sum of two image priors, one on this image and one on that image. And since we figured out that we know how to learn image priors in the first half of the talk, we just thought we'd apply the same thing. Okay, so one big difference between um, the problem I talked about before of image denoising and optical flow is that in order to do learning, we need data. And for images, it's very easy to get data. You just go to Google Images and you can download millions of images. But for optical flow, we need actually ground truth data. We need images that where we know for every pixel the exact speed and the direction. And there was a, gr a bunch of researchers at Microsoft Research and uh, collaborated with other people who tried to build a laboratory setup where they could move, in this case, a piece of cloth and capture it with two different cameras and somehow from those uh, cameras estimate the correct motion and this would give them uh, some idea of a ground truth flow, but it's only five or six images uh, that they could generate this way, and, and they're very artificial. You can't really have, um, it's, it requires basically uh, stationary objects that you hand move them from frame to frame and inside a lab setting. Uh, what happens, what has happened in the last three or four years is that we have some very interesting data sets that have come out uh, which have ground truth, and there's two versions of this. One is called Sintel, which is a very interesting open source computer graphics film. So it's actually a film that you can all download and watch. It's something like 15 minutes, which, and it's open source. It was done collaboratively by a bunch of computer graphics people and some artists, and uh, you know, it's, it's a film. And, but because it's a film, it's computer graphics. We know everything how, of how every pixel was generated, and we can figure out the speed and the direction of every pixel. Uh, the other example is Kitty, which is a joint between the Stockholm University and Toyota Institute of Technology, um, where they took a camera with an accurate GPS on, an, on a driving car, and they measured the distance to all sorts of objects. And since you know the ego motion, for stationary objects, you can also figure out how they move. Um, I just, for people who don't know this, computer graphics today is not your grandmother's computer graphics. So, this is the, these are very realistic. This film is very realistic. So what you see here, uh, I even have to think of realistically. On the bottom are frames from the computer graphics movie, from this computer graphics movie, and on the top are images found on YouTube that were most similar to that particular image. And you can see that, especially on this projector, but even if you go look closely, they're actually very similar in visual quality. It's not. These are not Bugs Bunny or Mickey Mouse cartoons. The, they can really model atmospheric effects, very interesting lighting effects, occlusion effects. Um, the motions are realistic. You have people fighting and uh, birds flying. And um, So uh, 
we believe that even though it's artificial data, it's, it's worth trying to learn a prior from this. Uh, and I think it's realistic enough that it's worthwhile. OK, I want to go very quickly over this part. So um, what we did is we just applied all this ground truth data. We used the same machinery of the Gaussian mixture models that we used in the, in the image restoration part. That is, we just took small patches, 8 by 8 patches from, the, from this top image, and 8 by 8 patches from this bottom image. Again, we have this for, for hundreds of images in the, in the Sintel movie. And we just feed these 8 by 8 patches into a Gaussian mixture model, and we see how well it works. <coughs> so again, this is log likelihood on held out patches. Uh, so the better, the higher these numbers are, the better you are at modeling the density. And we see that, again, uh, the Gaussian mixture model outperforms these hand-tweaked models that go back to the um, 1980s that were not probabilistic models, but we can turn them into probabilistic models and measure their log likelihood. And the Gaussian mixture model, as you add more and more components, it does better and better, and it outperforms the current methods. And you, one way you could use this is if you have very noisy versions of optical flow. So here are original on the top. These are the noisy methods. These are all sorts of standard priors used by computer vision researchers. And this is the learned model. And it does a much better job of reconstructing what was there behind the noise. And I don't have time to go into this, but just like I was mentioning the image restoration, because it's an it's a interpretable probabilistic model, we can go in and understand what the model learned. And it's very interesting. We can talk about that more later. We did the same for the data term. And a similar story, uh, people in the literature have argued about what is a better data term. We just learn it from data. And we do better in terms of log likelihood on held out patches. And again, it's interpretable. We can go back and say, oh, this is what the GMM learned. Yeah? Um, I think. I don't remember the numbers. How many pa training patches did we have here? Uh, yeah, 700 images. And you have something like a million patches per image. So, uh, yeah. It's actually an online algorithm, so you don't u necessarily use all the all 700 million training examples. But yeah, we have a lot of data. Um, and. The bottom line is when we try to do all this thing together, we end up with one million free parameters, both the, um, both the ground truth flow and the flow warp error. And at, at least in terms of log likelihood and held out data, we do better than the state of the art Again, with, the, with a million free parameters. Uh, we tr well, this is really a work in progress. So what the interesting thing that we want to work on now is given this learned model to actually run an algorithm that does the inversion, given two frames, estimate the most likely flow. And that turns out to be uh, much harder than we thought. Uh, it's a very non-convex problem. And although the general trend is consistent with the log likelihood, uh, the optimization details have much stronger effect than the cost function. So for machine learning people, we really like it when we don't have to inject any specific expert knowledge into the, into the thing. We just feed data, and magically the algorithm comes out. As far as learning, I think we're there. We, we have, a, I think, an algorithm that's relatively automatic and doesn't have a lot of knowledge built in. In terms of optimizing the model during runtime, we're currently using a lot of expert knowledge, and we're not doing a very good job of it. Uh, so other people can do it better. OK, so this is my last slide. Um, so I wanted to talk, and I was planning to talk a bit more about the relationship between graphical model and probabilistic models and neural networks. Uh, and I think I, just a preview of maybe of another talk I could give on this is really that there is something common. So if you go and you read the newspapers, you'll hear a lot about uh, the hype of uh, deep neural networks. And specifically, they'll talk about how millions of free parameters and excellent performance on very difficult problems. So at least that part is true not just for neural networks, but I think is more reflective of the fact that we have powerful computers, and a lot of data. So Gaussian mixture models are very different than neural networks in almost every possible respect. But, they, but if you feed them enough data and you give them enough free parameters, they can also give you state-of-the-art performance on some 
difficult problems that were studied by engineers for tens of years. And the advantage I see for the probabilistic models is that they give you interpretable results. You can go in and you say, oh, this is what the model has learned. It's not a pure black box. Um, so that's the good news about image restoration. A similar approach yields high quality density models for optical flow, but we still have a way to go before this can be used for flow estimation. Thank you very much. Five minutes for questions before you have to rush into the, uh, into the snow. Yes. Uh, it's a great question, actually. Dan is working on it. <laughs> uh, there was a paper at NIPS this year called Hierarchical Gaussian Mixture Models that also tried to do it. Uh, you know, there's different ways to, do, to build hierarchy, and uh, one way has been tried and gave almost no difference in performance. One, the particular way... Yes, gave almost no difference. But there are other ways of building hierarchy that we're thinking about that I think. Yes, yes, that, that's what they did, and that gives you very little. Uh, what in terms of fast description and classification now? There's both of the noising and the fast description. This is related to something that Max also mentioned in his talk, is that one of the reasons you often need hierarchy is that the first layer wasn't good enough at removing the dependencies. One of the problems with this particular approach, the Gaussian mixture models do a terrific job of getting rid of, of the dependency. So there was very little stuff to model for the second layer. Unlike uh, feed-forward convolutional neural nets, where the output is still highly dependent after a single thing, because it's only a linear thing followed by a threshold, this is a more sophisticated single layer. But there are other ideas that we're working on. I think hierarchy is a powerful idea. And I think uh, we'll, we'll find a way to make it work. Yeah, so as in a lot of things in computer vision, the sta a state of the art is a moving target. So it was the state of the art three years ago. Uh, the, I, the last thing I think that is, that is state of the art takes our method and three other methods, and this is actually from Microsoft Research Cambridge, and combines them. Uh, oh no, this, these are better. But um, I should also say there are deep neural nets that uh, have been trained to do image restoration, and they also work very well. So I'm not trying to claim that Gaussian mixture models work better than neural nets, uh, but and it, there's also some theoretical work that seems to indicate that all of, all of these methods that I just mentioned are very close to the optimum. I mean, there's a limit to how well you can do on image restoration. There's a base risk, and we, we seem to be very close to that. Uh, we, I just want to say before we have coffee after this, that we already ordered, so there'll be coffee and cakes. And you're welcome to ask me more questions during the coffee break. But go ahead. Okay. Is there a relation to the convolution neural net? Because uh, the results seem very uh, similar in terms of projection uh, again the vessels you generated with your Yes, it's an excellent question. Um, it's part of our grant. <laughs> so it's good that you mentioned. You could view the inference procedure that's done by the Gaussian, the Gaussian mixture model, there's an iterative algorithm that's used to denoise all these patches. And if you unwrap that in time in some way, you get something that looks similar to a to convolutional neural net. But again, the training is very different. Whereas convolutional neural nets are just trained to optimize performance on a particular task, and therefore cannot be used for other tasks. Here, the training is in a probabilistic way, and so you have a much more interpretable result and more modular. So you could think of this as an alternative way to train convolutional neural nets uh, if you wanted to. Okay. Okay, let's thank you here again. <laughs> um, so just before we end with uh, the next session, because I know it's an unplanned ending early, but we like, we thank everyone who came, especially after all the care out there. Uh, and, and all the ones who stayed until now, given those cares. 
Uh, a big special thank you for the two people who actually made this work in the background. So Regina and Monique who are sitting back there. Uh, eventually put this uh, conference, including uh, travel and many other details that we don't fit into place uh, very, very professionally and expertly, and we are blessed to have such great people working with us. And finally, I think we need to thank the, the funding for the for this event. Yeah, we did it in the beginning, but we can do it again. Um, <laughs> it's reluctant, but um, yes. Uh, so, so we have. No, it's, it's not that we're trying to avoid it. <laughs> uh, so we had, we, had, we had wonderful support from uh, the ISF, the Israeli Ministry of Science, and from Intel. Intel. Yeah. And so thank you very much. And Coffee outside. Coffee.